Hello, everyone. Welcome back and Happy New Year. So, as you probably know, for several months now, I've been researching Shakespeare. And as promised, I want to give my patrons a discussion of the Shakespeare authorship controversy, which is a way of referring to the debate, loosely speaking, over the notion that someone else actually wrote the plays and poems attributed to William Shakespeare. So previously, in my installments discussing Shakespeare's life and work, I've said that I would begin at the end, such as when I started my discussion of Shakespeare's life by talking about his death and his last will and testament. But this time, I want to begin at the beginning. One afternoon, somewhere in the English countryside, a poor tinker named Christopher Sly stumbles very drunk out of the front door of a tavern, still fighting with the tavern hostess, who is demanding that he pay for some glasses that he broke. The hostess gives up, and the man simply lies down and promptly passes out on the side of the road. While he is lying there, the retinue of a noble lord comes by, returning from the hunt. The lord notices the drunken man lying unconscious and has an idea. He proposes to his men to take this man, carry him back to the manor house, put him in one of the Lord's beds, dress him in finery and jewels, and when he wakes, pretend that he is in fact the Lord of the manor, and serve him and wait on him, and even instructs one of his page boys to dress as a lady and pose as the man's wife. And if he protests that none of this is real, they should try to convince him that in fact he is a wealthy lord and that he is merely waking from a false fever dream that he is just a poor drunkard. So the lord and his servants do this. They take the man back to the manor house, they dress him up, they put him in bed. And meanwhile, a troop of players arrives and offers to put on a show for the household. So they are sent off to the buttery to reconnoiter and prepare their play. While meanwhile, Sly awakens to the sound of music. The servants and even the Lord himself in disguise as a serving man try to persuade Sly that he is not who he thinks he is. The scene emphasizes the great gulf between the classes and the immense difference in experience and environment between the Lord, his retinue, and Mr. Sly. The servants try to entice Sly with aristocratic pastimes, almost as if taunting him. They offer to play more music, to take him horseback riding or painting, And most particularly, they focus on hunting. And the serving men say at one point, quote, Thou hast hawks will soar above the morning lark. Thy hounds shall make the welkin answer them and fetch shrill echoes from the hollow earth. Say thou wilt course. Thy greyhounds are as swift as breathed stags, I fleeter than the roe. Sly is not convinced and refuses to believe them until he is told that he has a wife. At this point, he quickly starts playing along with the joke and insists that his attractive wife come and undress and get into bed with him. Moreover, he suddenly switches from speaking in prose to blank verse, which is the form of speech that in Shakespeare's plays is normally reserved for characters of noble birth. Still, the wife refuses to get into bed with him, the so-called wife, in quotation marks, refuses to get into bed with him, and Sly obligingly agrees 
to instead pass the time for the rest of the day until nightfall by watching a play. At this point, the players enter and their show begins. And what is it? It's the Taming of the Shrew. So the Taming of the Shrew is the only Shakespeare play that begins with a framing narrative, a so-called induction, that sort of sets the scene for what this play is and why it's being performed. This frame narrative is interesting and significant, although as far as I know it hasn't been discussed very much by scholars, but it's significant for several reasons. One of them is that it introduces one of Shakespeare's earliest plays. The Taming of the Shrew is generally agreed to have been written by no later than 1592 at the latest, making it one of his earliest plays. And according to the Royal Shakespeare Company, it may actually be his earliest surviving play, dating as far back as the 1580s. This induction scene at beginning of Taming of the Shrew is also the only Shakespeare scene in any play that clearly makes reference to Warwickshire and takes place in Warwickshire near Stratford. There are several allusions to villages and towns around the area of Stratford, and hence it's the only Shakespearean scene that clearly is connected to the place of Shakespeare's birth and upbringing. For these reasons, one might question whether possibly this scene might have been intended as a kind of introduction of the author to his audience. And more specifically, whether the character of Christopher Sly is supposed to have some special significance. Christopher Sly, like William Shakespeare, is from the common classes of society, although he is even more poor and humble, apparently, in his standing than William Shakespeare was. He is a sort of country rustic from Warwickshire. He is also a heavy drinker. And according to the limited anecdotes that Shakespeare fans were able to collect around Warwickshire in the mid-1600s, one of the few things that we consistently are told about Shakespeare is that he was a heavy drinker. Moreover, Christopher Sly, like Shakespeare, takes on the erudite, refined speech of the upper classes, as marked in his transition into blank verse when he begins to take on and accept the fictitious persona of a nobleman. And one of the few consistent themes that we can see from contemporary references to Shakespeare from his life and career in London is that he was a social climber and that he was determined to obtain marks of gentlemanly status like a coat of arms. So for all of these reasons, we have to wonder whether perhaps Christopher Sly, whose name means sneaky or deceptive, might be a kind of self-portrait or self-satire of William Shakespeare, who came from Warwickshire to London and began to write verse plays that attained patronage, at least, from some members of the upper class. So as I said, this scene is not discussed very much, as far as I can see, in commentary on Shakespeare, including commentary by so-called anti-Stratfordians, meaning the insurgent groups of mostly lay Shakespeare fans, who think that Shakespeare did not really write the works attributed to him. It is mentioned briefly in the book Shakespeare's Unorthodox Biography by Diana Price, which I'll talk about more later. But beyond that, it hasn't gotten the attention that I think it might deserve in this whole debate, considering that it seems to be in these ways unique, uniquely connected to Shakespeare and his Warwickshire origins, and yet it portrays a lower-class country man being surreptitiously substituted in for a high-class aristocrat. Does this maybe explain the purpose of the induction as such? Is it possibly intended as a frame 
through which we should view all of Shakespeare's subsequent works? Is it a kind of open hint that William Shakespeare is somehow standing in or swapping in for the real author of these plays and poems, which some people argue was actually a nobleman? Well, I'm going to try now to discuss this question. Is there any ground for doubt that Shakespeare actually wrote the plays and poems that were published under his name during his lifetime in the 15 and 1600s? Or am I simply a crackpot, one more <laughs> crackpot, for even entertaining such a question? So many will immediately react by saying that this whole notion of Shakespeare's authorship being open to doubt is a kooky conspiracy theory, akin to believing that the moon landing was a fraud. But modern events like the moon landing are very heavily documented. There are literally millions of documents, hours and hours of footage, thousands of images, testimony from eyewitnesses, artifacts involved in the Apollo mission, as well as some brought back from the moon itself, coming from many thousands of different people and sources that were directly involved in the mission. And hence, one has to truly throw Occam's razor out the window to entertain for a moment the idea that all of this is somehow fabricated and that nobody ever came forward to expose this fraud in which they were involved. The same is not the case, at least not at all to the same degree, when it comes to Shakespeare's plays. There is very little surviving information about how these plays were staged. In most cases, we don't even know the dates when they first debuted. And we have no information at all about their composition. No surviving original manuscript drafts. No journals or correspondence mentioning the process by which Shakespeare wrote them. There are no personal surviving documents from Shakespeare at all, with the partial exceptions of his last will and testament, which makes no mention at all of his writings, and his sonnets, if you want to count those as private or personal documents. There are some documents from the time from people who saw or read the works, saw them performed or read them when they were published. But these scattered documents are ambiguous, mostly vague, and most of them are drawn from people who didn't know him directly or deal with him. Hence, it is understandable that many people might reject alternative authorship theories as implausible and argue that the evidence we do have firmly establishes that Shakespeare was the author, but nonetheless it is a valid historical question. It is simply a question, is it factually correct that the person named William Shakespeare, who was credited at the time with writing these works, really did write them? Or is that story false, or is it partly true and partly false? So this is a basic historical question that evidence and arguments can be brought to bear upon, and yet the debate has been carried on largely in, you might say, disreputable corners of publishing and now the internet, and has been basically shunted aside as conspiracy theory nonsense by credentialed scholars of literature. Why did this happen? If this is a valid historical question, why is it treated as so toxic? Well, there are many reasons probably why that is true, but there are a few that I'll point out. Conditions for the debate are so poisoned for a number of reasons. One is that alternative authorship as simply as an idea has basically been discredited by insane theories put forward by crackpots and that often involve bizarre far-fetched scenarios like 
the Earl of Oxford actually being the illegitimate love child of Queen Elizabeth, and so on. A second reason is that there is a generalized fear of conspiracy theories and sort of tinfoil hat madness that can proliferate and propagate itself very quickly and easily in the internet age. And I think legitimate scholars often feel the need to preemptively suppress and reject uh, a kind of barbarian invasion from these bizarre ideas circulating through the internet and alternative media. So that also has poisoned the well, I think, of this discussion. And thirdly, there is, I think, a very strong and exceptionally strong commitment, especially in recent decades, among academics to the liberal individualist myth of Shakespeare, the idea of the self-made bootstrapper who reached the top of his field based on his own genius and study and hard work. This is an image of the author that I think is especially beloved and flattering to academic self-image. So to give a little preview of what I want to do now in this lecture, I want to briefly define the problem, which includes discussing some of the reasons and motivations why Shakespeare's authorship ha has been questioned, give a short history of the dispute, the sort of twists and turns that it's taken over the centuries, and dispel a few basic misunderstandings about this debate, I want to re-examine some of the important evidence around Shakespeare and his authorship, including the early attributions to Shakespeare, contemporary references to Shakespeare and his career, and internal evidence in the plays. I want to consider whether there are possible other candidates and, more importantly, what criteria one might use for ruling alternative candidates in or out. Consider the range of other possible solutions that are not starkly on one side or the other, Shakespeare or someone else, and consider the range of possibilities in between, and I'll get to what that means. And finally, consider what is at stake in this debate, why it is so heated and why both sides seem to care so much. So firstly, to just define the problem and give a little lay of the land. As I said, there are people, you may have heard of this, who doubt whether or not Shakespeare wrote the works that were attributed to him when they were first performed and published. However, there is no such doubt among credentialed academic scholars who study Shakespeare. Among these legitimate scholars, there is total consensus that Shakespeare did write the works that are commonly attributed to him, the so-called Shakespeare canon of at least 37 plays, the sonnets, and the narrative poems. So this is a complete consensus. Now, those who doubt this common understanding among scholars call this, call this group Stratfordian, those who adhere to the idea that William Shakespeare of Stratford really did write these works, and their opponents call themselves anti-Stratfordians. And sometimes they'll also sort of uh, disparagingly refer to the mainstream scholarship and literature about Shakespeare as orthodox, and they'll call the attribution to William Shakespeare the orthodox position. Now, I think that's slightly unfair because it can make it sound as if people only believe this uh, based not on evidence, but simply because it's a kind of dogma, right? Uh, that's a common uh, criticism you'll hear of Stratfordian scholars, that they're just, they're just blindly following dogma. Well, in fairness, as a historian, the main reason why people adhere to that traditional attribution is that that is what our earliest available documents say. The published quartos and the first folio and the original editions of the poems all on their title page say William Shakespeare or W. Shakespeare. Totally unambiguous. That is the basic earliest evidence we have. 
And the burden of proof naturally lies with those who would deny the accuracy of that original claim. So I'm going to refer to this as the original attribution in contrast to alternative attributions to someone else. Now, I do also feel I have to point out that while there is this clear scholarly consensus among Shakespeare experts, these scholars are literary scholars, right? not historians. <laughs> I have to pull credentials here for a moment and say literary scholars, their job is to analyze and interpret literature in its social context. It is not their job or their discipline to reconstruct historical events the way historians do, where it is, it is our job to, you know, by, by the criterion of Occam's razor, to come up with the best reconstruction of what happened in the past based on the available evidence. And I would argue that literary scholars who often have done very good work in their field don't necessarily think like historians and weigh and uh, contextualize evidence as well as they could. And I, as far as I know, no historian has really brought the historical process to bear on this question. So that's what I want to do a little bit now. So, as I said, the burden of proof lies with those who would say that the original attribution of the plays and poems to William Shakespeare is wrong. So what reasons or motivations have come up over the years that have led people to question or doubt that attribution? Well, there are several kinds of claims that people have made, some stronger than others, but just to give a little summary. The biggest one is the content of the works themselves, the allusions, the information, the, the knowledge, the learning that is reflected in the substance of these works. For one thing, they contain extensive and well-versed references to upper-class pastimes and ideas. There are many examples of this, different sports like royal tennis, but most especially hunting and specifically falconry. And we saw one example of that come up right in that induction of Taming of the Shrew that I already read. The author of Shakespeare's works clearly was very knowledgeable, if not directly experienced, with hunting, which was the traditional sport of the landed aristocracy. This sort of knowledge is often used for the purpose of extended metaphors, not just little allusions to add realism like other writers might do. Also extensive knowledge and familiarity with music and musical instruments. The works also show very rich classical erudition, deep familiarity and study, particularly with Latin classics. Shakespeare was clearly a lover of Ovid, also of Livy. And they use references that clearly go beyond a normal grammar school curriculum of the 16th century. They also show a certain degree of erudition and wide reading in living languages from the European continent. So the plays make frequent references, borrowing incidents, characters, even phrases from works in French, Italian, and Spanish, most of which had not yet been translated into English in Shakespeare's time. Shakespeare sometimes even reuses certain English words with new meanings that were not familiar in English, but that mimic similar words in Italian. They also show extensive knowledge of continental geography, particularly Italy. One third of Shakespeare's known plays take place in Italy, and they contain a great deal of accurate depiction of geographical landmarks, relations, and transport between different Italian cities, awareness of specialized Italian uh, art forms, cuisine, folk stories, and history. There are also a couple of errors of Italian geography, but these are really overwhelmed by the much more abundant, accurate information 
And all of this, of course, has grabbed many people's attention when you consider that there is no record of Shakespeare ever having traveled abroad, no record of his having any education at all, although he probably did attend grammar school, there is no evidence of any higher education, no evidence of tutoring, no evidence of extensive travel, or of his presence in any noble or aristocratic household in England, where he could have learned all of this very specialized knowledge. Another reason that Shakespeare's authorship has been called into question is the lack of corroboration of his status as a writer. There are no surviving manuscripts from his hand other than six signatures on legal documents, no surviving correspondence with anybody, fellow writers, tutors, patrons, nobody, no journal or commonplace book, There is no clear reference to Shakespeare as a writer from any of his relations, neighbors, and extensive friends and business partners in Warwickshire. There is one surviving note from a vicar in Warwickshire which noted that Shakespeare was a successful actor, but it has no mention of his writing. Shakespeare's father was probably minimally literate, and his daughters were illiterate and signed documents with a mark. There is no record of any transaction dealing with writing involving Shakespeare, no one paying him to write, no record of his receiving payment for the publication of his works, etc. There is one possible arguable exception to this. In the year 1613, the household of the Earl of Rutland made a payment to William Shakespeare and Richard Burbage, a fellow actor, for creating an impresa, which is a sort of ceremonial shield or device that one wears on one's armor with emblems, maybe a coat of arms, and a motto, usually a Latin motto. And so scholars believe that this payment was made to Burbage and Shakespeare because Burbage painted, he was an artist, uh, this impresa, and Shakespeare wrote the Latin motto. Although it does not, the record does not say that explicitly, that's what has been inferred, and that is the one and only likely uh, surviving record of Shakespeare having been paid or employed as a writer. Another reason that his authorship has been called into doubt is logistics. How did this particular man, William Shakespeare, who lived 52 years, how was he able to produce at least 37 plays, probably more, that contain very complex plots, complicated character development, scene and setting changes, time leaps, and so on, as well as two long narrative poems and other shorter poems and his series of 154 sonnets, while also acting as a leading performer in the Lord Chamberlain's Men and the King's Men, serving as a theatrical business manager and investor, and carrying on a very active business in finance, real estate, and commodities, frequently shuttling back and forth between London and Stratford, and meanwhile also do the necessary study that was called for for his composition of these works, studying classical texts and languages, history, several living languages, law, theology, sports and pastimes, etc., etc. Does this at some point start to sound implausible? In fact, in the history of theater, only Moliere, the great French playwright, is a similar example of an accomplished playwright who also was an actor and theatrical manager at the same time. So just on that level, Shakespeare and Moliere are unusual. How could Shakespeare have done the same while also actively engaged in business in several different lines of work in two different cities? At some point, does this not start to sound rather far-fetched? So those are probably the main reasons why his status as the author of these works has been called into question. 
There are other reasons as well that may be worth considering, such as the timing, but I won't get into all of that. There are experts, of course, who have worked very deeply on Shakespeare's chronology, and we just won't. We'll leave that out of this discussion. So as I said, these are internal and external reasons why people have questioned Shakespeare's authorship many times. But just to give a brief overview of the history of this so-called authorship debate. In Shakespeare's own time, it was clearly generally accepted that Shakespeare was the author of the works attributed to him. People spoke of him as a writer and praised his style and his accomplishments, and we'll talk about that later, about those references to Shakespeare. There doesn't seem to have been any open questioning of Shakespeare legitimately being the author of these works. There are some small passing private notes where people attributed Shakespeare's works to other writers like Samuel Daniel, but that may have been mistaken or intentional, but those are comparatively rare. Over time, especially after 1700, it seems that doubts started to bubble up little by little, especially in the theatrical world, which is not surprising considering that there was a great upsurge of interest in Shakespeare the Man, who had produced these renowned works, and researchers were not able to find much information about him at all. And so we see mostly sort of joking or satirical asides starting to come up, such as a play in 1759 in which a woman asks who wrote Shakespeare, and her male companion answers, Ben Jonson. This may have just been a little joke. Perhaps it reflects an increasing mood of skepticism or confusion. In 1786, in a play called The Learned Pig, a superintelligent talking pig claims to have composed all the works of Shakespeare and accuses William Shakespeare of being an imposter. Again, this may be just a little joke, not to be taken seriously, but it does seem as if this may have been a way of kind of letting out doubts or frustration over the lack of information about Shakespeare. By the mid-19th century, it seems this mood of doubt was reaching a breaking point. And in 1857, an American teacher named Delia Bacon published a book called The Philosophy of the Plays of Shakespeare Unfolded. And in this book, Delia Bacon, no relation, argued that Francis Bacon was the actual primary author of the works and that he led a clique of politicians and statesmen who had been forced out of power and who in political exile came together to write plays criticizing and attacking arbitrary monarchical authority and leading a sort of underground resistance to the Elizabeth and James monarchy. Now, this probably wasn't a completely original idea, and indeed it quickly touched a nerve and gained a lot of popularity and a lot of attention, especially among lay people and non-experts, and led to a wave of works trying to bolster this theory and to verify Bacon as the true author. These works eventually, it seems, convinced many Shakespeare admirers and fans, including Mark Twain and Helen Keller, who wrote positively about the Bacon theory. And they were attracted to it in large part, it seems, because of their belief that literary works reflect the real-life experiences and views of the author, right? And, and Twain, in particular, really advocated for this idea that all fiction is truly autobiographical. And hence, since the plays of Shakespeare show no connection at all to the life story of William Shakespeare, the real writer must have been someone else, like Bacon. Commentators in this Bacon movement tended to focus a lot on The Tempest and to see this as the most quintessentially autobiographical of the plays. And at the end of The Tempest, of course, we see Prospero, a very powerful, learned scholar and magus and alchemist of some sort, 
willingly giving up his power and destroying his papers. Right? In the closing, Prospero says, I'll drown my book. And so they saw this as an echo of Francis Bacon choosing to possibly destroy his manuscripts and records relating to the plays and erase from historical memory the fact that he had written them. Now, no one was able to find any corroborating documents or evidence connecting Bacon to the plays. And so eventually this movement began to devolve, you could say, into looking for coded ciphers, right? Hidden messages embedded somehow in the plays that would reveal Bacon as the true author. And also searches for lost or hidden manuscripts that Bacon must have disposed of somewhere. But all of these efforts failed. So by around 1900, the Bacon theory was really failing and dropping out of favor. But nonetheless, doubts persisted, especially among writers like Henry James, who continued to believe that William Shakespeare of Stratford couldn't possibly be the author. And after 1900, among Shakespeare enthusiasts, there was an increasing turn away from radical or oppositional aspects of Shakespeare's plays to more conservative ones. And you start to see advocates for a more conservative social mindset gain more and more interest in the Shakespeare authorship question. There was also an increasing turn towards psychology and towards excavating the deep emotional relationships in the plays. There was more and more of a focus, especially on Hamlet, as sort of the key to Shakespeare and his inner life. And in 1920, a British writer named J.T. Loney, although it's spelled like Looney, quite suggestively, J.T. Loney, who was the leader of one of the leaders of the logical positivist church called the Religion of Humanity in Britain, which tended to have a sort of authoritarian mindset, right? This, this slogan of order and progress, of orderly leadership by the upper classes. One of the leaders of this Religion of Humanity, J.T. Loney, published another book called Shakespeare Identified. And in it, Loney argues that the real author is actually a high-level aristocrat named Edward de Vere, the Earl of Oxford. And the initial reason that he lit upon Oxford is that in his published poetic works, Edward de Vere used similar poetic forms to William Shakespeare's poems. So that was the initial link. And then Loney found that there are many striking parallels that match up plot lines in Shakespeare plays to Oxford's known experiences and exploits. And one of the famous parallels is in Edward de Vere, the Earl of Oxford's strained relationship with his three daughters, much like King Lear. He also had a fraught relationship with his father, who died around the time when scholars believe Hamlet was composed. So you see a, another possible psychological parallel there. So this Oxfordian school of thought emerged from the popularity of Loney's book. Oxfordianism was very strong in both Britain and the U.S. in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. But again, as with Bacon, this movement found no smoking gun. And furthermore, if one cl more closely analyzes the style and language of Edward de Vere's poetry, it does not quite match that of Shakespeare, and the case has weakened somewhat over time. The school began dying out and losing followers, especially in the 1950s and 60s. And those who remained had an increasing interest in, you could say, zany conspiracy theories, the notion that there was a grand cover-up for political reasons, that Oxford or the Earl of Southampton or both were illegitimate love childs of Queen Elizabeth. However, in the 1980s, this school of thought began to revive and experience a kind of second flourishing, 
largely by using debates in public forums like magazines and also mock trials in which lawyers and judges were enlisted to argue and judge the supposed dispute between Stratfordian and Oxfordian. The judges who oversaw these supposed cases in the 1980s generally were not won over to Oxford, but they did increasingly express doubt about Shakespeare and to endorse the view that there was legitimate question about Shakespeare's authorship. So this gave the Oxfordian camp a bit of a boost of legitimacy, although by this time no credentialed academics at any university subscribed to the Oxfordian theory. And the Oxfordian camp then exploded in the 1990s and the 2000s, particularly with the internet, right? And Oxfordians have used direct communication over the internet to great effect, to the point that if you search about Shakespeare and authorship, it can seem as if most fans of Shakespeare are are Oxfordians. Uh, In fact, no scholars of Shakespeare are Oxfordian. Uh, Some scholars of other fields are Oxfordian, so professors of philosophy or other disciplines sometimes have signed on and endorsed the Oxford theory, and also other lay experts, you could say, on Shakespeare, such as the Shakespearean actors Derek Jacobi and Mark Rylance, subscribe to the Oxford theory. Now, also at the same time, there has been a sort of continuing contention within the anti-Stratfordian camp. Not everyone is Oxfordian, and indeed there's also been something of an increase in recent years of adherence of other theories, the notion that it was really Christopher Marlowe or Ben Jonson or any number of other possible candidates. And so this can really cloud the issue in a lot of ways. It can make it seem as if anyone who questions Shakespeare's authorship must be advancing some kind of convoluted, kooky conspiracy theory for their preferred pet candidate. And in fact, there is only one author, I think, that we can point to who has taken a really unique approach of trying to argue against Shakespeare's authorship so she is an avowed anti-Stratfordian, but she does not argue for any particular preferred candidate. She is, you could say, a general and agnostic anti-Stratfordian. And that author is Diana Price. Now, note, I don't say scholar. It's maybe a bit of a stretch to put her in that under that label. Diana Price is trained and has a degree in museum studies. Right? She is not a literary scholar and she's not a historian. But she did do very meticulous archival research and analysis, as well as careful comparison of records about Shakespeare to those of other writers from the same time period. And despite her lack of a PhD in the field, she was able to get articles questioning Shakespeare's authorship. She was able to get such articles accepted into the Review of English Studies and the Elizabethan Review, both of which are respected peer-reviewed academic journals, the former of which is edited by Oxford University Press. And Oxford University Press, along with the Royal Shakespeare Company and the Folger Shakespeare Library, is probably one of the three main institutions that sort of curates the, the Shakespeare legacy. In 2001, she published a book called Shakespeare's Unorthodox Biography, which was published by Greenwood Press, a fairly respectable press that that has published many uh, serious academic authors. In Shakespeare's Unorthodox Biography, she sums up various anti-Stratfordian arguments, including most of those that I laid out earlier. But she does so without committing to any particular candidate. She emphasizes the scarcity of records, about Shakespeare and his supposed literary life and the ambiguity and evasiveness of many of the surviving contemporary documents that do talk about Shakespeare. She points out, as I said, the rich and readily available knowledge that the author of the works clearly had of upper-class topics, particularly the Romance languages. And she points out the common taboo against publishing literary works on the part of 
the upper class, what she refers to as the stigma of print. And I'll talk about this probably more later. The publication of this book led to a great deal of consternation, and it provoked many Stratfordian scholars to address the question and finally try to put this authorship debate to bed, where previously most academic scholars had treated the whole authorship controversy as totally disreputable and not worth talking about at all. The biggest and most important response was probably James Shapiro's book called Contested Will, published in 2010. Contested Will combs through the history of this dispute, the often political motivations and ulterior agendas of many of the anti-Stratfordians. And at the in the end section, he tries to finally refute the whole idea that anyone else other than Shakespeare could possibly be the author. And also significantly, he puts a lot of the blame for this dispute dragging on. He puts much of the blame on Shakespearean scholars because, in his view, the original sin that led to this whole mess was when Shakespearean analysts, going all the way back to Edmund Malone, began trying to draw links between the plays and the author's life. In his view, that is a fundamentally modern assumption and a misguided one to think that literary works are outgrowths or reflections of the author's own personal experience. And in his view, even raising such a possibility is what let the genie out of the bottle, and Shapiro wants to put it back in. So that brings us up more or less to the present day as far as this dispute goes. Now, if we put all of that aside, I want to try to reframe the question in hopefully a more useful way. What we have is a basic dilemma of plausibility, meaning a question of two possibilities and which one is more historically credible. The first one is that William Shakespeare of Stratford-upon-Avon wrote a series of plays reflecting deep erudition on all sorts of specialized topics, especially ones associated with the upper classes, but with no record of any higher education, tutoring, or association with the upper class, and without leaving behind any personal records or manuscripts as a writer. But he did nonetheless leave behind a long trail of business and financial records as a financier and real estate broker. So either that is the more plausible scenario, or second, some other person wrote these extensive and sometimes popular works over the course of about 30 years, yet nobody, even people who knew Shakespeare in person and dealt with him, ever bothered to mention this fact or to even hint that someone else other than Shakespeare was the real author. So I would say prima facie, just looking at these two scenarios, either one seems extremely far-fetched. Neither one is a scenario that I would consider plausible, except for the fact that one or the other has to be true, unless, as I mentioned, there is some other possibility in between. I cannot say, based on my knowledge and research that I have, which is limited, that I can know which one of these is the better explanation. But having done some research and looked at the arguments on either side, I will confess that I tend to lean towards the second option. Well, what is the context in which we would have to judge this complicated dilemma? Well, for one thing, there is abundant occurrence of anonymous and pseudonymous publication from the 16th and 17th centuries. There are many important literary works, including the very popular and influential play, The Spanish Tragedy, that were, were published anonymously in Elizabethan England. And in the case of the Spanish tragedy, the author was not identified as Thomas Kidd until 1773, almost 200 years later. 
And that is from one small stray note that someone made in their commonplace book about a, a quotation they had taken from the play. If not for that, we probably still would not know that Kidd was the author. And it doesn't seem as if anyone at the time was bothered by this. There are no written records of anyone saying this is wrong or this is aggravating or there's a problem with these works being published anonymously. There are also many examples of false attribution from the time of people publishing works under the name of someone who didn't write them at all. There are even a number of examples of false attribution of works to William Shakespeare. For instance, the book of poems, The Passionate Pilgrim. Most of the poems in that book were not by Shakespeare at all. And on later in the 17th century, in 1640, another publisher printed a book called Poems Written by W.S., clearly intended to signal that they were by William Shakespeare, when in fact none of them were by Shakespeare. In addition, plays, such as the play Locrine, published in 1595, was falsely attributed to William Shakespeare. So was London Prodigal in 1605 and the Yorkshire Tragedy in 1608. So all of these plays scholars today put into a basket which they call the Shakespeare Apocrypha, right? works that were attributed at the time to Shakespeare, but either probably or definitely were not really by him. Now, there are several important implications of this. One is that we cannot take title page attributions at face value. Sometimes they were false. For one reason or another, a publisher either was mistaken or they thought they could get some commercial advantage from falsely attributing a work to an author. So they could be wrong. And moreover, there is no record anywhere of anyone ever coming forward at the time and saying, this is a lie, London Prodigal wasn't by Shakespeare, or Yorkshire Tragedy wasn't by Shakespeare. It's taken years of scholarship and analysis to figure out exactly what is canonically Shakespeare and what is apocrypha. But if this is true, if we accept that these plays are apocryphal, we then have to stop and ask, well, how do we know that all the works attributed to Shakespeare aren't apocryphal? What is our basis for concluding that the other plays, particularly the ones that appear in the first folio and the books of poetry attributed to Shakespeare, really are Shakespeare? Don't we have to call the authorship of all of these works into question. Now, one obvious response to this is the fact that there's an unusual consistency over time when it comes to Shakespeare. When we look at the works, the other works attributed to him, especially those that were included in the first folio, there is a certain commonality of similar style and similar themes. And moreover, we can also see a stylistic development where his style seems to have evolved to become more romantic, more mysterious uh, over time. And hence, it makes sense to group most of these works together as being by a single author. And if, in fact, William Shakespeare wasn't the author of this vast bulk of work that we call the Shakespeare canon, well, it does seem that there is a very peculiar and glaring pattern that if someone else was writing them, why is it that so many people, including these publishers, consistently attributed these works to this one particular false author, William Shakespeare? Right? There must be a reason why that happened if we are to entertain the idea that someone else is really the author. So again, this is our dilemma. Is it that someone else wrote these works that show certain consistencies and stylistic evolution, and yet for some reason people kept falsely thinking and claiming that Shakespeare was the author? Or is it that something so extraordinary and exceptional happened that this man, William Shakespeare, was able to write works that show these kinds of knowledge and experience that simply do not fit at all into his known life story? Well, I want to look at some of the evidence on one side or the other more closely. But first, I should dispel some immediate questions that tend to come up right away 
as soon as the authorship controversy is mentioned. Okay, so for one thing, why would the real author, if it wasn't Shakespeare, why wouldn't that real author come forward and claim authorship of these works? Well, that's an understandable question, but it involves certain assumptions that may be wrong. For one thing, the notion that being associated with plays in the theater was a good thing. Plays in the theater were a way to make some money, get a bit of fame on the street, get friends, sexual partners. People did these things. But it was not very socially reputable, right? It was seen as kind of a low-class form of entertainment. And specifically for the extreme upper classes, the royal court and the aristocracy, it was extremely frowned upon to have any kind of profession, any work that you did, particularly for the public, to make money. That meant that you had lost your status as a gentleman. And hence, it may have been very desirable if a high-class courtier or aristocrat was, in fact, producing verse plays and poems. It may have been very desirable for them to remain anonymous and not be publicly known as the author. And this is probably a major reason why there was so much anonymous and pseudonymous literary publication at the time. Right. We've I've already in my other lectures, I've mentioned books like Willoughby, his visa that was probably written by John Florio. Uh, and if you look at any anthology of English poetry from this period, you see many works listed as anonymous. And probably many of those were being produced by men or women of the high upper classes who didn't consider it to be of their advantage to be identified as an author. Another question is, well, shouldn't we just listen to the experts? Don't the experts just know? And that's fair enough. All other things being equal, you should trust the experts in the field. However, all other things may not be equal. Experts sometimes have their own biases and motivated reasoning. They may have personal interests or ideological interests in maintaining a certain party line, as I mentioned before. In addition, as I said, this is really a historical problem. It's about what is the most plausible chain of events that could have led to the production of the particular kinds of evidence that we see in front of us. And yet the experts in this field are literary scholars, not historians. Another matter that comes up immediately when you bring this up is snobbery. Aren't the people who question Shakespeare's authorship snobs. Well, there are several reasons why this is a totally unhelpful and counterproductive reaction. One is simply that it's ad hominem. It doesn't matter if the people who argue one side or the other of this question are snobs. What matters is the validity or persuasiveness of the arguments they make based on the evidence. Even if we put that aside and say, well, attacking people as snobs counts as an argument, that doesn't account for the large number of people who have subscribed to all kinds of alternative authorship theories who are certainly not snobs. I mentioned Mark Twain, Helen Keller, also Walt Whitman. Many of the leading advocates who have embraced these alternative authorship theories have actually been the opposite, have been people with overtly populist and egalitarian sensibilities. And furthermore, it's really, it's a straw man attack, okay? Attacking anti-Stratfordians as snobs, or the whole argument is snobbery, really confuses the issue. The matter that that at least the better anti-Stratfordian arguments seize upon is not the quality of the works. In other words, they don't say that William Shakespeare from Stratford, a man who was the son of a glover, couldn't have written great works. Instead, it's the content, it's the type of specialized knowledge and erudition that is written into the works, right? So the issue is, could William Shakespeare have created these particular literary works, not he couldn't have produced works that are this good, right? Maybe some Oxfordians have said that, maybe other anti-Stratfordians have said that, but that is not the main line of argument, right? And hence, it is not a matter of snobbery 
but rather it is a matter of the style and content of the works as compared to the background of the person who purportedly wrote them. And if we look today, uh, you know, today there are literary geniuses, right? People of incredible linguistic skill and eloquence who come from modest backgrounds, right? You can think of, for example, freestyle rappers who have an incredible verbal richness and dexterity who come from modest backgrounds. But you can tell that they come from that sort of less privileged background in their style. No one would confuse a freestyle rapper, however brilliant he or she may be, with a Cambridge classicist. Right? You can hear in the language uh, the, the kind of verbal and linguistic world that they've been immersed in and in which they are fluent. Right? So their background still very much shows through. Right? And if you were to say a freestyle rapper wrote Hamlet, understandably, your audience would be skeptical, regardless of what they thought about the intelligence of that writer, right? It just doesn't make sense. Also, you'll, you'll often hear this sort of dismissal, but he was a genius. Oh, it's, you know, maybe it's far-fetched. How did Shakespeare write these works referring to Ovid and Livy and the Arabian Nights and so on? But he was a genius, so he could do it. Right. Well, there are a lot of problems with this sort of hand-waving explanation, but he was a genius. If we already accept, for one thing, that Shakespeare was amazing and exceptional in language and wit and observation, saying that on top of that exceptional ability, he also was an autodidact who obtained and mastered all of that knowledge on his own, that only makes it even more unlikely. You're sort of saying that lightning struck twice or three times the same person, right? It is not just because he was a genius on one level doesn't mean that therefore it's believable that he also was unbelievably exceptional on further levels on top of that, right? And it's, it's a way of, it's a kind of magical thinking, right? To just say, we don't need explanations of, of his life or his education because he was just a genius. There's of course the objection, this is a conspiracy theory, right? And certainly, uh, many anti-Stratfordians are conspiracy theorists. That's absolutely true. But that doesn't mean that's the only reason or the only way to theorize alternative authorship, right? Ox traditional Stratfordian scholars, I think, have increasingly come to see the authorship question in Oxfordian terms, the debate has been really defined by Oxfordians as a stark either-or scenario, right? Either it was Shakespeare, or if not Shakespeare, it was a grand convoluted conspiracy with the hidden author, who surely must have been politically important and powerful, pulling strings in order to cover up his activities, right? And neither side, I think, in this debate today really considers that maybe it wasn't a grand conspiracy. Maybe it was just a matter of convenience and comfort. Maybe this is a matter of a high-class, possibly powerful person approaching a troupe of actors and an actor like William Shakespeare and saying, please... Tell people that you're the author of this work. I'd rather not be publicly identified. Right? And it seems this did happen. The, the famous pamphleteer Robert Greene refers at one point to this type of arrangement. In a preface to one of his works, he says that authors from the upper class could sometimes contract with, quote, a batillus which is a classical reference to a man who could pose falsely as an author and stand in for the real author who didn't want to be publicly known, whether because it was politically dangerous or it was socially embarrassing. There are incidents rather like this even today. You can think of the author J.T. Leroy, who purportedly was a young man who had grown up in a situation of abuse and drug use, but was able to pull his life together and write memoirs. And it was found out that actually J.T. Leroy was not a real person. It was a persona that a female author had made up to sort of explain her 
fiction, really, and that she had been sending a male relative of hers to public events like book signings to pose as J.T. Leroy until eventually fans figured out he was not a real person, right? So the J.T. Leroy incident, I think, is very revealing. You know, an author tried to pull off this ploy. It did work for a while until eventually someone, you know, looked through public records and figured out he was not real. Someone else was writing these supposed memoirs, right? Well, maybe in the 16th and 17th centuries, the same kind of thing could happen. But people either didn't have the means to know or they didn't care. Maybe they didn't value knowing who the author of a work was the way we would today. And in a way, that kind of brings us to the last question of, well, it doesn't matter. This is something I've heard and you may often hear from Shakespeare fans when the authorship controversy is brought up. It doesn't matter or I don't care. Right? Now, that is a totally reasonable attitude. If you are an appreciator of the literature, then it's reasonable enough for you to say, well, all I care about is how great is this work and what does it say to me? So in other words, if the only questions are aesthetic or matters of appreciation, then maybe you don't and shouldn't care. But what about art history or just history? Right? What about knowing how these works were produced so you can understand what kind of conditions and experience and possibly education it took for someone to be able to compose the, what are considered the greatest works in the English language. So if you're looking at it from a point of view of art history or simply history, it does matter. So let's again look back at the available evidence we have and see if any of it can help us to point towards, towards the best solution of this dilemma. Well, as I said before, false attributions, the use of pseudonyms, and anonymous publications were all common at the time. And hence, although the earliest evidence that we have of Shakespeare's authorship is simply his name on the title pages of the works, that may not be enough. So authors in the Elizabethan and Jacobian age did not have much copyright authority. They, they didn't have much control over whether their work was published or how. And in most cases, they didn't derive any benefit from it. Right? And that's probably true with Shakespeare. He probably never made a penny off of the publication of any of his works other than Venus and Adonis and the Rape of Lucrece, which it seems were authorized by the author. When it comes to the plays, many of them were simply leaked, probably by actors from play scripts, notes from memory, taken to publishers who then published them for money. And so publication in itself was not necessarily very desirable for authors. Maybe it could help cause buzz and raise their profile, their notoriety. But whoever wrote the plays, if they made any money off of them, it was from ticket receipts at the theaters, not from publication. And attribution in publication wasn't necessarily really desirable either. So if the attribution on the title pages of Shakespeare's work was false, then you might ask, well, why wouldn't the real author have come forward? and complained and said, you're stealing credit for my work. But evidently, that's simply not what happened in this case or maybe in any other cases either. There are so many cases of anonymous or false or pseudonymous attributions, many of which have not been solved and scholars are still puzzling over. And all in all, it seems that many authors simply didn't do anything, kind of resigned themselves to the fact that their work was being misattributed. Specifically, if we look at the case of Shakespeare, uh, most biographers, including Samuel Schoenbaum and Stanley Wells, tend to agree that Shakespeare did not seek publication of his work, but rather somebody, uh, maybe playgoers or more likely actors, simply took working scripts that they had or notes from memory and took them to printers uh, 
to get maybe a small paltry payment in return for handing them over. And furthermore, all of the earliest printings of Shakespeare's works, of his plays, I should say, not of poems, but of his plays, were anonymous. Right? For several years, Shakespeare's works were published anonymously before any of his plays appeared with his name on them. So, for example, in 1594, Titus Andronicus, Henry VI, Part Two, and probably The Taming of the Shrew were all printed anonymously. In 1595, so was Henry VI, Part Three. In 1597, Romeo and Juliet, Richard II, and Richard III were all printed anonymously. And then finally, in 1598, after four years of plays appearing in print, finally, some of them, such as Love's Labor's Lost, were printed with an attribution to William Shakespeare. So apparently he had been working in theater for at least six years, probably longer, and intermittently seeing works published anonymously before any appeared with his name on them. But we do know that by this time, by 1598, a number of other plays of his had been written and produced and were understood by at least some people to be by William Shakespeare. And we know that only because of Francis Mears's commonplace book, which he composed in 1598, in which he spoke about Shakespeare as an eloquent writer and praised many of his plays. So even after this point, after 1598, many of Shakespeare's works fell into a pattern of mistaken or changing or anonymous attribution. There were works published anonymously and then later attributed to Shakespeare. There were works published attributed to Shakespeare that weren't really by him, that scholars agree were not. But nonetheless, it seems if you look cumulatively from the publication of Venus and Adonis in 1593 through these various quarto editions of the plays and on up to the first folio in 1623, there is a certain ongoing consistency over three decades, right? Common styles and themes, an arc of stylistic development. So it makes sense to group this together as a single author. And hence that raises the question, as I said before, if that author wasn't really Shakespeare, does this constitute some kind of conspiracy? Or at least, if we put that loaded word conspiracy aside, does it at least reflect a kind of ongoing arrangement or agreement? That if someone else was writing these works, they had made an agreement, maybe with Shakespeare himself, maybe with the Lord Chamberlain's men, that when this work reached the public, it should be said to be by Shakespeare, right? That Shakespeare could act as kind of the front man and collect credit for these works. That seems to be possible, but at least we have to say that this is what the public understood and that this must have been what audiences understood when the plays were performed, that Shakespeare was the author. It cannot be that the real author went directly to printers and publishers and said, please put the name William Shakespeare on these works, because authors had no control over printers and publishers. They printed whatever they wanted. So it seems, based on this limited information, it seems maybe plausible that, the, that an author, other than Shakespeare, supplied plays to the acting company and asked for them to be presented to the public as works of William Shakespeare, and that then eventually that is the information that made its way to printers and ended up appearing in print. This, of course, raises the question of why. Why would the author do that? Perhaps he or she was an aristocrat, a courtier concerned about political connections and reputation. In 1589, the English critic George Putnam published a book called The Art of English Poesy. And in this book, he spells out this basic situation that I'm referring to. He says, quote, So as I know very many notable gentlemen in the court that have written commendably and suppressed it again, or else suffered it to be published without their own names to it, as if it were a discredit for a gentleman to seem learned, 
and in Her Majesty's time are sprung up another crew of courtly makers or writers, noblemen and gentlemen of Her Majesty's own servants, who have written excellently well, as it would appear if their doings could be found out and made public. So there is a record here of courtly aristocrats and gentlemen, as he says, wanting to keep their authorship private, right? Either not allowing their work to be published or when it is having it published anonymously or under false names. So now Stratfordian scholars understandably reject this scenario. And they do so mainly by pointing to contemporary testimonies and references about Shakespeare from the time that they believe establish that much of London society was aware of William Shakespeare, was familiar with him, and understood him to be the author. And they would have remarked if they thought that that was a lie. So let's look at, again, at these contemporary references that tell us about people's impressions or knowledge about Shakespeare from his own lifetime. If we look at these contemporary testimonies, they mostly tend to fall pretty clearly into two categories. There may be some overlap. If you imagine a, a Venn diagram with two circles, there may be a bit of overlap between them, as we'll look at, but they mostly tend to fall pretty clearly into one category or the other. The first category that I'll describe is references to Shakespeare as a person with a life story, a personality, a career, and so on, penned by people who probably had some kind of personal interaction or personal knowledge of Shakespeare. The second category is references to Shakespeare as an author that comment particularly on his writings and their quality. Very rarely, and maybe never, I would argue, do those two groups overlap. But if we look at those that definitely refer to Shakespeare as a person, right, his background, his appearance, his personality, these are mostly penned by people who must have had some kind of dealing or interaction with him. And these include, for one thing, the passage in The Groatsworth of Wit, the pamphlet published in 1592, that describes Shakespeare as a player and as an upstart crow. There is the possible satire of Shakespeare in Ben Jonson's play, Every Man Out of His Humor of 1599, where it seems pretty likely that the character Soliardo is a parody of Shakespeare trying to obtain a coat of arms. There is the amusing anecdote written down by the law student John Manningham in 1602, again, which I talked about before in my lecture on Shakespeare's life, where he recounts supposedly Shakespeare preempting Richard Burbage and meeting up with a woman for a tryst and saying, quote, William Shakespeare was before Richard III. There is the passage in the book Microcosmos by John Davies of 1603, which refers to W.S., probably William Shakespeare, as a player and praises his personality, quote, generous ye are in mind and mood. There is another brief reference by a rival actor who refers to Shakespeare in a positive way as so dear loved a neighbor, probably speaking of him metaphorically as a fellow actor. And these sorts of compliments come up, again, usually in reference to Shakespeare as an actor, but do not mention him as an author or a writer. There are also similar cases to this in anecdotes from after Shakespeare's death that were collected later in the 1600s. They tend to talk about Shakespeare as an actor and a performer and as friends with other actors but don't refer to him being a writer. There's the very strange poem, again, by John Davies in his 1610 book, The Scourge of Folly, where he talks about Shakespeare performing, quote, kingly parts in sport. There's also, and I lastly want to talk about this one, an undated note written down by George Book, the master of revels in London, which he penned on the title page 
of a copy of a play called George A. Green. So this play, George A. Green, was published anonymously. And on his copy, George Book, the master of revels, wrote a handwritten note saying, quote, written by blank, there's an actual blank, written by blank, a minister, who acted the pinner's part in it himself. Test W. Shakespeare. So the pinner is, is someone who catches stray animals, and that's the main character in the play. And then test is a Latin word meaning witnessed or testified by W. Shakespeare. So James Shapiro, in his book Contested Will, uses this little note by George Book as a kind of centerpiece of his argument. And he points to it as evidence of a personal direct meeting between George Book and Shakespeare. So if we look in Shapiro's book, he argues that George Book is among those who recognized Shakespeare and knew him by name. And using this little note as evidence, he says, quote, he might have sought out or run into Shakespeare at the Curtain or Globe playhouses or at a court performance or perhaps at London's bookstalls concentrated around St. Paul's and the Royal Exchange, where Shakespeare must have been a familiar sight browsing through titles. Shakespeare did his best to help Book, recalling that the play had been written by a minister, but at this point his memory apparently failed him. The lapse was excusable. It had been many years since Georgia Green was first staged, but Shakespeare did volunteer an unusual bit of information. The minister had acted in his own play, performing the part of the pinner. A grateful Book wrote down his finding on the Quarto's title page, leaving space to insert the author's name later, and so on. Shapiro is really drawing a whole scenario, kind of imagining a whole scene. Where and how did Book meet Shakespeare? He must have sought out Shakespeare and reconstructing the entire interaction from this one little note. Well, looking at this as a historian, I would say, yeah, that's possible, but is that information all really there in that little note? Do we even know that Book had a direct face-to-face -face interaction with Shakespeare? We can say, well, he must have known him, but then again, he might have gotten this information indirectly by asking around, asking someone else. Maybe that's why the information is incomplete. Maybe it wasn't that Shakespeare's memory failed. Maybe it's that Book got this information through the grapevine. So even if we credit Shapiro's argument that, that this note reflects a direct face-to-face -face interaction between two men who knew one another personally, what bearing does that have on the authorship question? Well, Shapiro puts this note front and center as part of an argument that many people knew and personally interacted with Shakespeare, and therefore it's impossible that there was some kind of conspiracy of silence or that everyone somehow was too dumb to realize that Shakespeare didn't really write the works that he wrote. Well, that's fair enough as far as it goes, but it ignores, or I would say it contradicts, another aspect of Shapiro's argument, which is that people at this time in the early modern world didn't care that much about authorship. And they didn't try to draw links and connections between the life or personality of an author and their literary output. And so maybe George Book did suspect Shakespeare wasn't really the author. We don't know. There's no record of his feelings or views one way or another. If he did have any doubts, it doesn't seem he wrote them down. Maybe he just didn't care. Maybe this wasn't a big deal to audiences at this time. And so they weren't really asking the question the way that we might ask the question today after having combed through and analyzed all of his metaphors and traced out what were all his literary sources from France and Italy and ancient Rome. Maybe this is a proper question that we have to adjudicate now that just didn't come up uh, at the time. Well... Of course, there are other references, as I said, to Shakespeare from the time that do speak of him as being an author and as having written these 
works. So let's look at what those contain. Well, there's one in the prefatory poem at the beginning of the book, Willoughby His Avisa, which I talked about before when I talked about the sonnets, published in 1594. And this preface briefly mentions Shakespeare, quote, who paints Lucrece's rape, right? So clearly making an allusion here to Shakespeare's authorship of The Rape of Lucrece, which was indeed published under his name in the same year, in 1594. There is Francis Mears's Commonplace book, which I spoke of before, where he refers to honey-tongued Shakespeare and praises Shakespeare's fine filed line. And it goes through a list of Shakespeare's plays, many of which are then reprinted again in the first folio attributed to Shakespeare. In around that time, in the late 1590s and early 1600s, there are also a handful more brief references and mentions of Shakespeare as a poet, as one of the good poets of this era. And he's sometimes called sweet or honest or good Shakespeare or sweet will or good will. These references probably are like Francis Mears referring to his style, right? To his good or sweet or pleasant style, right? And honest in the sense of lucid, based in clear, understandable English, right? Rather than dense with classical Greco-Roman allusions like Ben Jonson, right? So these probably also are style, stylistic comments about his reputation as a writer. None of them contain any reference at all to who he was, where he lived, where he came from, what he did, the fact that he was an actor, who he knew, right? Or even to specific works of his, right? They're just reflections of a general literary reputation. Also in 1598, there's a reference by Richard Barnfield, a poet who included in his book a short quatrain referring to Shakespeare as honey flowing, and it makes allusions to his poems Venus and Adonis and The Rape of Lucrece, both of which probably were more popular and successful than any of his plays. There is then the Parnassus play number two, which I also discussed before in my first lecture about Shakespeare. It was probably written around 1600 by students at Cambridge. It's a silly satire, and it contains a sort of a romantic character infatuated with poetry named Giulio, who is a fan of Shakespeare and particularly loves Venus and Adonis. So this is another reason to think that that poem was particularly popular. And all of these references, again, make no indication that the people writing them knew Shakespeare in person, that they had any dealings with him. Right. It, they're all based on the quality and reputation of his works. Right. So thus far, it seems these two groups do not overlap. There were people who had some knowledge or interaction with Shakespeare as a person, and there are those who know of him as an author, and they are separate. Now, some of them, you could argue, actually cross the line and straddle this line and may indicate that at least some people knew and dealt with Shakespeare, and believed he was an author. So let's look at these. There are five in particular that stand out that I've picked out. And let's look at what they actually say and whether they demonstrate anything about Shakespeare being an author. Well, the first one, again, is The Groatsworth of Wit, that pamphlet from 1592, which was supposedly by... Robert Greene, an old university-trained writer of great pretensions who had just died. In The Groatsworth of Wit, the author, whoever he was, addresses three young playwrights who are sort of up and coming at this time, Marlowe, Nash, and Peel. And he warns these three playwrights to stay away from a particular troupe of actors that he finds to be untrustworthy and not to be dealt with. And he describes this troop of actors as, quote, those puppets that speak from our mouths, those antics garnished in our colors. Yes, trust them not, for there is an upstart crow beautified with our feathers, 
that with his tiger's heart wrapped in a player's hide, supposes he is as well able to bombast out a blank verse as the best of you, and being an absolute Johannes factotum, is in his own conceit the only shake scene in a country. So this is a very weird, convoluted passage, thick with cryptic references, right? But clearly Green, or whoever the author is, uh, is disdaining these, these actors, whom he calls puppets and antics, garnished in our colors. that They have taken or borrowed something from these playwrights. And he specifically points out one of them is an upstart crow beautified with our feathers. Right? And traditionally in, in, in classical fables, which Green certainly was familiar with, the crow was understood to be an animal, uh, to, to be a thief, an animal that steals other birds' feathers and uses brightly colored feathers from other birds to embellish his own black figure, right? So there's clearly a parallel being set up here between the crow stealing other birds' colored feathers and these actors who are, as he says, garnished in our colors. So the crow, and most scholars agree this upstart crow is definitely Shakespeare, this crow is taking something from these playwrights, our feathers, beautified with our feathers. The question is, what is it? What is, what is he taking? What is he thieving for himself? Well, Stratfordian scholars customarily say, well, what he's stealing is the very art of playwriting itself, that this upstart, this non-university trained nobody, which is what Shakespeare would have been in his eyes, is committing an offense merely by writing plays, right? And he's sort of stealing this art form that should be reserved for highly educated gentlemen like Marlowe, Nash, and Peel. Well, this strikes me as a very, very strained interpretation, right? Why, why would you be upset just by the fact that he's writing plays? And if he's not good at it, then what are you worried about? And why is it that that he's saying to these other playwrights, Marlowe, Nash, and Peel, don't deal with this, with this uh, acting troupe or with Shakespeare because they're doing something wrong, right? I think that if you look at the phrasing, beautified with our feathers, it clearly parallels and echoes the earlier phrase, those antics garnished in our colors, right? So what are those things? What are these colors that these actors are taking on that they're somehow getting from the playwrights? Well, to me, the obvious answer is plays. The playwrights have been supplying plays to this acting company. Those are the colors that they are putting on. And likewise, the hour feathers with which the crow is beautifying himself are also the, are the same thing, are the plays. So to me, when I read this passage, it strikes me that the obvious reading, the obvious meaning is Shakespeare is taking plays that don't belong to him, and he's beautifying himself with them in the sense maybe that he is performing them the wrong way, he's embellishing them, extemporizing, right? He is as well able to bombast out a blank verse as the best of you. He's adding in lines, changing lines, because he thinks he's that brilliant or that eloquent. And he's taking credit for plays that he didn't write, that we wrote, that belong to us. That is what strikes me as the clear, obvious reading. Now, you could still disagree, but Stratfordian scholars don't customarily do the obvious thing, which is keep reading further in the passage to find the context and see if the context tells us what are the feathers that the upstart crow is stealing. So the next sentence after this reference to Shakespeare is, quote, Oh, that I might entreat your rare wits to be employed in more profitable courses, and let those apes imitate your past excellence and never more acquaint them with your admired inventions. Right? Your admired inventions clearly are your compositions, your plays. So he's saying here, heretofore, 
you, playwrights, have supplied this acting group with plays, but you should stop doing that. And he even says further down in the next sentence, seek you better masters. So this implies a business relationship. They've been paid to supply plays. And if that is what's happening, if previously they have been supplying plays to this acting troupe, then what does it mean that this upstart crow is beautified with our feathers? To me, it seems he's stealing our work. He's plagiarizing or he's taking credit for things we wrote and he didn't. Now, you could disagree, right? But to me, that seems to be the obvious plain reading. And I think that Stratfordian scholars tend to ignore this and to particularly to lop off the rest of the passage, right, that involves profit and masters and this clear pay relationship with the playwrights. They lop that off and ignore it because it raises this uncomfortable association with the idea that Shakespeare is taking someone else's work. (laughs) And there are a lot of, that's a kind of third rail topic in Shakespeare scholarship. The next instance is, again, the Parnassus play. Now, I talked about a moment ago, Parnassus play number two, which has this character, Gulio, who is a Shakespeare fan. Well, then Parnassus play number three was produced probably in 1601. And in this play, I talked about this a bit before in my first lecture on Shakespeare. Uh, Will Kemp and Richard Burbage, the actors from the Lord Chamberlain's men, who were friends and associates of William Shakespeare, they appear in this play. They appear as characters in the play, right? And Kemp has lines where he comments on Shakespeare as a writer. And so this fictitious Kemp says that university men don't write good plays, right? They're too erudite. They smell too much of that writer Ovid, right? And so on. And then he says, quote, why here's our fellow Shakespeare puts them all down. I and Ben Jonson too, Oh, that Ben Jonson is a pestilent fellow. He brought up Horace, giving the poets a pill. But our fellow Shakespeare hath given him a purge that made him betray his credit. Okay, again, very cryptic, very unclear what the heck that is referring to. It certainly does seem as if this fictitious Kemp in this play is saying that Shakespeare is a writer and that he doesn't use lots of classical junk like these other guys, like Ben Jonson does. But this play, written by university students at Cambridge, did they actually know anything about William Shakespeare? It seems that probably they understood Shakespeare to be an author, right? That was the information that they had, and that's what they're going on. But notice that they have Kemp and Burbage show up as characters in this Parnassus play, but not Shakespeare. They don't seem to have any particular awareness of who Shakespeare was, what he did, what he looked like, what he acted like. They're just throwing him in here, apparently, as an author to compare against Ben Jonson. Now, I want to look here at what, again, at what, James Shapiro makes of this passage because there's a pattern here of James Shapiro which I think is common to a lot of Stratfordian scholars of taking these brief allusions to Shakespeare as a writer and trying to blow them up to mean much more than they do and trying to draw many implications out of them that as a historian it seems to me just aren't there. So Shapiro quotes this passage from the Parnassus play and says, quote, In this up-to-date reference to the poet's war raging at the time in the London theaters, Kemp also notes that Ben Jonson is a pestilent fellow, he brought up Horace, etc. For these Cambridge undergraduates, Shakespeare was a living, breathing presence, one whose poetry they knew by heart, whose literary sparring they followed closely. Really? (laughs) How do you know that? I don't know what that passage is talking about. Now, he may be correct, 
that this is a direct reference to the poet's war raging at the time in the London theaters. I don't see how it is. I don't know how you know that. I would be very interested to know what is the corroboration of that argument. What is the supposed incident that this passage is referring to? And in order to get that information, I'd like to follow a citation. But there's no citation. In fact, there are no citations anywhere in contested will. There are no footnotes. There are no endnotes. There's a bibliographic essay at the end where he sort of tells us, here are the good books you should be looking at as sources of this information. But there's no way to trace these specific claims to their sources. So as a work of history, it's Contested Will is a useless book. I can't verify this. And again, the pattern that I see is taking these very scant and often very vague and ambiguous allusions to Shakespeare and trying to draw all kinds of biographical and historical implications out of them without clear support. Now, thirdly, there's another possibly stronger allusion that seems to connect Shakespeare to playwriting. And that is in a weird poem, again by John Davies of Hereford in his book, The Scourge of Folly in 1610, right? So I referred to this earlier. It talks about Shakespeare playing kingly parts in sport, right? Clearly alluding to him being an actor. It also has a prefatory line at the top that says, to our English Terence, William Shakespeare. Now, Terence was a famous Roman playwright. So it does seem here as if within this poem, John Davies is referring to Shakespeare as an actor, right? And as a writer, implying that he was both. Okay. So in this case, it seems we do have one instance of somebody at least talking about Shakespeare in both capacities, as an actor and as a writer. Does this mean, therefore, that he really was a writer? Does, is that, is, does this verify that claim, that he was a writer? Well, Terence was a very talented and prolific Roman playwright, but one of the things he was also known for was the accusation of plagiarism, that he had stolen plays, particularly from members of the upper class. So is it possible that John Davies of Hereford is making a similar implication here to what we saw in The Groatsworth of Wit, that Shakespeare reputedly claimed credit for work that was not his? Don't know. But there's arguably a little bit of a pattern there. Fourthly, Diana Price claims in her book that There is no instance anywhere of anyone who had a personal relationship with Shakespeare referring to him as a writer in any kind of personal record or note, right? This is one of her arguments, that Shakespeare stands out from all other writers of the time, that no one who dealt with him personally talks about him as a writer. However, Stratfordians have criticized her book and put forward exceptions, Particularly, they've pointed to one instance of someone whom they argue did know Shakespeare personally and who talked about him as a writer. And that is a note put on a flyleaf of a book by a fellow writer and translator named Leonard Diggs in 1613. So it seems what happened is that in that year, 1613, this English writer, translator, and diplomat, Leonard Diggs, was in Spain. And while he was in Spain, he and his boss sent a friend in England a book of Spanish poetry. The book was Rimas de Lope de Vega, a a book of, of Spanish sonnets by the Spanish writer Lope de Vega. And Diggs put a note onto the flyleaf in which he likened Lope de Vega to, quote, our Will Shakespeare. So this sounds like a personal reference to Shakespeare, right? A friend of ours, an associate, our Will Shakespeare, and refers to him as a writer, like Lope de Vega. So it sounds personal, and moreover, there is a connection between Leonard Diggs and William Shakespeare. So Leonard Diggs' stepfather, Thomas Russell, was from Stratford. And 
he was appointed as one overseer of Shakespeare's last will and testament when Shakespeare died in 1616. So it seems as if Leonard Diggs had had a personal relationship to Shakespeare through his stepfather and refers to him in this personal way as our Will Shakespeare, who is a great writer. However, we have to ask, is it really a personal reference? Although Diggs' stepfather must have had some connection to Shakespeare, there is no further evidence of any personal meeting or acquaintance between them. It seems that Diggs was a literary admirer of Shakespeare, and he later contributed verses praising Shakespeare to the 1623 First Folio. And if we look back at the context, the full context of the note, we should ask, well, is this really reflective of a personal relationship? And then the full note refers to and commends this book of sonnets, which Spaniards hear is accounted of their Lope de Vega, as in England, we should, of our Will Shakespeare. So clearly here in this note, Leonard Diggs is paralleling their Lope de Vega with our Will Shakespeare. In other words, Spain's great poet and sonneteer, Lope de Vega, as compared to England's William Shakespeare. So he's making a claim to Shakespeare as a poet of England. There is no personal reference at all and no implication of any personal link. And moreover, the comparison is being made between two books of sonnets, right? Lope de Vega's sonnets with Shakespeare's sonnets. Presumably, right? Probably he has in mind Will Shakespeare's book of sonnets, which had been published four years earlier in 1609. So there is no indication here of any personal acquaintance, although they may have been personally acquainted, they may have had a personal relationship. All the available actual evidence just says that this is a case of Leonard Diggs praising a poet that belongs to the nation and whose work is exemplified in his published book. So this, again, I think is an, an, an instance of a common pattern of grasping at straws, of scholars trying to find very brief, ambiguous references to Shakespeare that contain little or no actual personal information and trying to use them as illustrations of personal relationships with Shakespeare and comments that should indicate that people knew for a fact that William Shakespeare was a writer. Okay, now finally, the last personal references we have to consider are posthumous references to Shakespeare as a writer by Ben Jonson. And there are two of these. There are two points where Ben Jonson wrote about William Shakespeare and at least apparently implied that he was a writer. And these are the most important. So one is Ben Jonson's eulogistic poem in the 1623 folio, where he clearly refers to Shakespeare the man, right? He talks about him being from Stratford, right? The Swan of Avon. He doesn't give any clear description or explanation of the man's life. It's just sort of a generic impression and praise. But he does definitely say he is, he is a playwright, he is the wonder of our stage, and he is the man who came from Stratford. And then secondly, there's a passage in Johnson's memoir, called uh, Timber or Discoveries that was published much later after his death in 1641. And here he discusses Shakespeare's personality and demeanor and again implies pretty clearly that he was a playwright. Uh, but let's leave that till later, right? Those are both posthumous. There are many questions about exactly what Ben Jonson said and what it might mean. So let's leave that for a moment and just say that altogether, if we look at these various references I've discussed, each purported link seems pretty small, right? And doesn't necessarily give us much information. But added up, there does seem to be a strong picture that emerges that people knew of Shakespeare, they had some sort of dealings with him, 
And at least some of those explicitly said that he was a writer. And this raises the question then, could all of those people be wrong? Is that plausible or conceivable that somehow all these people had a, a false understanding or they were all lying, right? Which maybe is the, the most far-fetched of it all, that this was all a kind of conspiracy of silence to keep up this lie. There is a pattern, as I said, of Stratfordians, though, grasping at straws, right? Trying to stretch sources to say more about the person or about the writer than they really do, and trying to push the sources to confirm that people who dealt with Shakespeare in person knew of him as being a writer, right? And this, I think, may be a case of just normal motivated reasoning, right? Of scholars coming with a certain preconceived conclusion and wanting the sources to fit that conclusion, even though they don't tell us all that much, right? And there are other examples of this I could quickly name. Uh, when Diana Price and others have said there's no surviving correspondence from Shakespeare, Stratfordians have said that's not true. There is correspondence, and they've pointed to an unsent letter that was drafted by two associates of Shakespeare in Stratford that they never sent and in which they intended to ask Shakespeare to lend them money. So for one thing, it's, it's a stretch to call that correspondence if there's no evidence it was ever exchanged. And secondly, even if you do count it, it says nothing about Shakespeare as an actor or a writer. It's just about finance. Uh, there are other uh, examples like this as well. When anti-Stratfordians say there are no surviving manuscripts from Shakespeare. Stratfordians counter that isn't true because there is a passage in the unperformed and unpublished play Thomas More, which clearly was a collaborative play written by several different authors. And there's one section in the middle in a particular distinctive handwriting that has a speech that has a lot of language and allusions and images that seem like Shakespeare. So many scholars believe that that section of the play probably was drafted by Shakespeare, right? And so Stratfordians will point to that and you say, you see, so there is surviving manuscript from Shakespeare. But that passage in Thomas More is unsigned. Nothing says who wrote it. All we know is that based on the style, it was probably the same person who wrote the works attributed to Shakespeare, right? So it only counts as a Shakespeare manuscript if you first assume that Shakespeare really is the author of the works attributed to him. And hence, this is a case of begging the question. It's simply invoking, <laughs> it's invoking the conclusion that you're trying to prove as evidence in your argument, if someone else wrote the plays of Shakespeare, which is the notion that's in dispute here, then probably that other person also wrote the passage in Thomas More. So I think this is one of many cases where you see begging the question, desperately stretching the evidence, grasping at straws, trying to create an, an appearance of certainty and overwhelming evidence, where in fact what we have is small, ambiguous scraps of evidence. And it's remarkable to me how similar this seems to what many anti-Stratfordians do, trying to find little similarities in wording, trying to find little ambiguous allusions to this or that person being a poet, and using that to try to construct a theory that it was really someone else, it was really the Earl of Oxford, it was really Francis Bacon, and so on. Okay, now let's go back to this other really important issue that I mentioned before and put off, which is Ben Jonson. So it's very common, you'll see in books, you'll see in popular literature, the notion that Shakespeare was sort of buddies with Ben Jonson, and that they hung out together, drank together, and had a sort of rivalry and traded witty barbs, right? This is something that came up in anecdotes in the late 1600s, and then it's been repeated and blown up over time. All of this is very dubious, right? There is no contemporary documentation of a relationship between Johnson and Shakespeare, other than three points where Johnson mentions Shakespeare. 
One of them is in his cast lists of actors who performed in his plays. He twice mentions Shakespeare as an actor. And then there is the first folio and in his memoirs, Timber or Discoveries. There are also, in addition to that, likely references, veiled references, that Johnson made to Shakespeare's works in his own writings that are indirect, but that are probably about Shakespeare and apparently are derogatory, right? He really had a lot of negative feelings about Shakespeare and his works. There's the satire in Every Man Out of His Humor, right? So with the buffoon, Soliardo. There are indirect digs at Shakespeare's plays in Johnson's prefaces to his own works, such as the preface to Bartholomew Fair in 1614, where he derides, quote, those that beget tales, tempests, and such like drolleries. All right, so that is pretty clearly a reference to Shakespeare's recent plays, The Winter's Tale and The Tempest, right, which apparently Johnson didn't like. There are also references in a recorded conversation that Ben Jonson had with his friend William Drummond in 1619, where Jonson again puts down Shakespeare's plays, says that they are unlearned, and that Shakespeare, quote, wanted art, right? meaning he lacked artistry in his work, right? A very harsh and general put down of Shakespeare coming just three years after Shakespeare's death, right? So all in all, it seems that Johnson was at best ambivalent about Shakespeare. He does say in 1623 in the first folio that Shakespeare is a great writer, right? One of the great writers of all time and that he was a great man. And that is probably the number one single piece of evidence that people point to to dispel the idea that anyone else wrote the plays. Why on earth would Johnson lie? Here is his testimony. Well, for one thing, we have to consider that it seems Johnson was lying about his opinion about Shakespeare, right? He didn't really think his works were good. There are many pieces of evidence that add up that show that, in fact, he he saw Shakespeare as as talented but not a masterful writer and that his works were second rate. And so he was, when he wrote this effusive praise in the first folio, he was probably doing so because he believed that would help him commercially, right? That he was trying to sell this book and make money off of it, right? He is not a disinterested party here. And if that's true, we have to consider, well, could Johnson have maybe suspected that Shakespeare wasn't the real author? Or maybe if he really believed that Shakespeare was the real author, maybe was he mistaken? Was he not realizing what was really going on? Was he one of the people who basically just conveniently went along with the convenient fiction of Shakespeare as a writer when that isn't really what he was? But let's put that aside for a moment and look at the second and much more private discussion of Shakespeare that we find in Ben Jonson's writings, which is in one of the last passages of his memoirs that he collected over the years, and that were then later published after his death in 1641. So we're talking about probably composed 20 years or so after Shakespeare had died and then published later. And he has a paragraph where he talks about our Shakespeare, and he says, quote, I remember the players have often mentioned it as an honor to Shakespeare, that in his writing, whatsoever he penned, he never blotted out a line. My answer hath been, would he had blotted a thousand, which they thought a malevolent speech. I had not told posterity this, but for their ignorance, who choose that circumstance to commend their friend, whereby he most faulted, and to justify mine own candor, For I loved the man, and do honor his memory on this side idolatry as much as any. So here we we have Ben Jonson recalling a, a very awkward interaction, where he says the actors who remember Shakespeare, who dealt with him, and may maybe included Hemings and Condell, who helped to collect the first folio, they are praising Shakespeare, and they praise him by saying he never blotted out a line. Thus, this implies that when the actors received their play scripts to rehearse and perform the play, there were no corrections. Everything was clean. Well, for one thing, A number one, doesn't that sound a little shocking? This is something that I've never seen 
<laughs> Shakespeare scholars discuss. Can you actually believe that Shakespeare delivered plays with no corrections? Which is something apparently unheard of at the time, right? There would be blottings, editings, notes, revisions. Did Shakespeare not revise his work? How did this happen? Well, anyway, the actors consider this a good thing, maybe because it made it easier for them to act the plays. Ben Jonson says, well, would he had blotted a thousand? Right? I wish he had corrected or taken out lines. It is not a good thing, in Jonson's view, that he didn't make revisions. And this seems to be in line with Jonson's general kind of opinion, current of opinion about Shakespeare, that he was not a refined or masterful writer, that he was sloppy. But then he says, but I don't want them to think this means I didn't like Shakespeare. right? And he goes on to discuss his personal dealings and interactions with Shakespeare. And he says, I loved the man and do honor his memory on this side idolatry as much as any. Okay, maybe true, maybe not. And he says, he was indeed honest and of an open and free nature, had an excellent fantasy, brave notions, and gentle expressions, wherein he flowed with that facility that sometimes it was necessary he should be stopped. So this seems to resonate with other things we've heard about Shakespeare, like in The Grotesworth of Wit. He bombasts out a line of blank verse, right? He seems to be a guy who considers himself witty and can speak extemporaneously and improvise with eloquence. He no longer, at this point, Johnson no longer says anything about him as a writer or a playwright. He's now talking about how he behaved in person. It was sometimes necessary he should be stopped. Suflaminandus erat as Augustus said of Heterius, his wit was in his own power, would the rule of it had been so. So he makes this classical allusion here to Heterius, who was a Roman orator who was known to be eloquent but to go on too long. He's using a very appropriate classical allusion here, right? This He, he couldn't shut up, right? <laughs> Sometimes you had to, to try to shut him up. And he goes on to say, many times he fell into those things, could not escape laughter. As when he said in the person of Caesar, one speaking to him, Caesar, thou dost me wrong, he replied, quote, Caesar did never wrong, but with just cause, and such like, which were ridiculous. So here he's describing a scene that he seems apparently to have seen in person, right? Shakespeare in the person of Caesar. He is acting the part of Julius Caesar. And the other actor says to him, Caesar, thou dost me wrong. And Shakespeare replies, Caesar did never wrong, but with just cause. And according to Johnson, people laughed at this. They found it ridiculous. This is in line with his reference to Shakespeare again as a monument, right? A person who, who invites ridicule. And Johnson is claiming that this is the sort of thing Shakespeare did. This was a common occurrence. He would, as Johnson seems to be saying, he would make up lines or compose lines on the fly or maybe get them wrong, erroneously, in a silly, ridiculous way that people laughed at. Now, this exact line doesn't appear in the play Julius Caesar as we see it in the first folio. Rather, the line flows logically as it appears in the play. So what seems to be happening here, according to Ben Jonson's anecdote, is either that Shakespeare flubbed the line, or that he was kind of working on the fly and improvising something that didn't work and later had to be ironed out so that it appears correct in the play. Now, the latter possibility seems to be precluded by what we see earlier in the same passage, that the actors said Shakespeare didn't make corrections. So this seems to imply here that possibly Shakespeare is messing up his own lines in his own play, <laughs> and that this is part of what people found silly and ridiculous about Shakespeare. So again, this raises the possibility or the question, did Johnson have these sort of confused, conflicting, mixed feelings about Shakespeare? Because on the one hand, he considered him a great writer and was impressed with his work, but on the other hand, in person found him to be silly and pompous and ridiculous. And maybe is Johnson here just avoiding stating the obvious, which is maybe Shakespeare didn't write these things. <laughs>
maybe someone else is working on these plays and coming up with them in very polished final form, handing them over to the players, and then Shakespeare is just claiming, I'm the writer. And this raises the bigger issue of circles, right? If we entertain this notion that someone else was really writing the works attributed to Shakespeare, then we have to ask, okay, if that's true, then who knew and who didn't? Shakespeare would have had to know. The real author or authors would have to know. What about his other close associates? Ben Jonson probably wasn't a very close associate. It doesn't seem they were very close. Did the other actors know? Maybe, maybe not. Did any audiences know? Maybe, maybe not. There's many possibilities. How do you draw the sort of circle or the, you might say, the cone of silence around who knew about this lie or this convenient fiction and who did not? There are all sorts of possibilities. Now, Stratfordians would say, well, that shows you why this whole idea is a grand conspiracy theory and it's unfalsifiable because you can always throw people in or out of that basket. And that's true if you are completely committed to this argument that it was someone else and you are unscrupulous and you are unwilling to debate fairly, then yeah, you can create a moving target. Johnson did know or he didn't know. Uh, Condell and Hemings did know or they didn't know. The master of the revels did or didn't, right? You can, you can draw the line any which way. But at the same time, you could also just say, well, maybe it's an open question. Maybe we don't know. There are many possibilities. But it seems as if Johnson, if it is true that Shakespeare wasn't the author, Johnson didn't know that. But he certainly seems to suspect something weird is up. There's something odd and contradictory about Shakespeare. Beyond Johnson, there are other people who supposedly were literary friends of Shakespeare, according to later anecdotes, people like the poet Michael Drayton from Warwickshire. There are also many close friends and associates, family members of Shakespeare in Warwickshire, and none of them ever seems to have mentioned anything about Shakespeare being a writer, a poet, a playwright, anything like that, right? There's one mention, as I said before, of him being an actor from a vicar in Warwickshire, and that's it. So does this mean that the people around him from his personal life or his literary life didn't know he was an author? I mean, that seems a little far-fetched. Did they not care? Did they just not see it as significant? Did they see it as a topic that they should just politely ignore and not bring up? So all in all, it seems there is an accumulation of evidence to show that some people at the time did see Shakespeare as the author of the works attributed to him. And there was no explicit questioning, certainly nothing straightforward or in print, questioning his authorship. So hence, anti-Stratfordians have to then account for this. Right? How could it be that people didn't ever raise any suspicions Diana Price makes the argument that, well, probably there was a kind of polite silence around the question in the same sort of way that press, secret service, government officials knew about John F. Kennedy's affairs, but thought that it would have been rude to bring that up publicly, right? They respected this powerful person and his position to leave sort of let sleeping dogs lie. And Price argues that the same thing may be applied if there was a high-class aristocratic author who was writing these works and who didn't want to be known publicly. People just knew to avoid it. Uh, That may be a valid argument. People who are greater experts on the Elizabethan period maybe could comment more on whether that is plausible or not. I would just say, look at what Shapiro says. The fact that according to Shapiro, that people in the Elizabethan and Jacobian age didn't care that much about authorship. They were perfectly fine with all kinds of anonymous and pseudonymous works appearing and using them and performing them. And they didn't see it as necessarily mattering how literary works connected to the author, to his or her life or experiences. And maybe that's why people just didn't really talk about it or have much to say about it one way or another. Okay, the last significant body of evidence 
to consider is internal evidence in the plays. And this is really, ironically, this is probably the most problematic evidence, right? The evidence, because these are grand works of fiction, you can't make any easy extrapolations about what was likely true or false about any real people from these fictional plays, right? And so anti-Stratfordians, whether they support Bacon or Oxford or someone else, they often gravitate most quickly and directly to the plays, trying to sort of find the secrets there within the plays. But there is internal evidence in the different versions of the plays as they were published in the 15 and 1600s, and even Stratfordian scholars like James Shapiro will point to certain sorts of internal evidence. For example, in the quartos, there are sometimes accidental substitutions of actors' names for characters. Like in Henry IV Part I, where there's a line for Falstaff, sometimes instead you see the name Kemp, as in Will Kemp, the actor who is playing Falstaff. And Shapiro argues this shows that the author was accidentally slipping and putting in an actor's name instead of the character. And in his view, this indicates that therefore the author must have been someone enmeshed in this acting troupe who knew the actors, who thought of them by name, and and who knew beforehand what sort of parts they'd be playing. Well, that's an interesting argument, but we have to question, well, is this necessarily the author's error? The author didn't probably deliver his or her manuscripts directly to the printer to be published. Rather, it was the actors who copied over or wrote down from memory versions of the plays that they then brought to be printed as quartos. And if that's the case, then maybe it wasn't the author's error, but the actor's error, right? Maybe maybe this was Kemp's copy of the play, and so he wrote in Kemp instead of Falstaff, right? So this I find to be unpersuasive, right? It doesn't necessarily have to point to Shakespeare being the author. And I would argue that this sort of point, drawn from kind of mistakes in in the plays or references in the plays, is overwhelmed by other internal evidence in the plays that points to a very erudite, highly cultured, upper-class author, right? the sort of evidence I pointed to before, the knowledge of languages, of geography, of upper-class pastimes, of the classics, etc., etc. And this points to a general sort of wider problem of what sort of argument from the contents of the plays is admissible. There is an imbalance, you could say, an inconsistency around this question of what can be inferred from the contents of the plays. Is the rule, the proper rule, that one shouldn't make any inferences at all from the editing or language or style of the plays? This is the sort of thing that Stratfordians often will say in order to counter Oxfordians, right? And they'll say you can't infer things like university training or an aristocratic upbringing from the content of the plays. But at the same time, Stratfordians do the same thing that they reject when it comes from Oxfordians. Stratfordians will, for for instance, infer that Shakespeare must have had a grammar school education, right? And this is their explanation for how he knew Greek and Latin and Ovid and Livy and so on, that he was educated at the Stratford Grammar School. Well, there is no documentation showing that Shakespeare attended the grammar school, right? That those records are lost. So they infer it from the content of the plays that he must have been educated at the grammar school. So in this way, both sides, or both schools, Stratfordians and Oxfordians, are making inferences about Shakespeare's education and upbringing based on the content they see in the plays. The dispute is over just what they should infer, right? Should you infer just a grammar school education, or is that inadequate and you should infer further, more extensive education. Well, how do you adjudicate? I can't adjudicate between those two positions because I am not enough of an expert on the education of the time. But it's the sort of thing that a historian ought to be able to weigh, right? I'm just not that historian because it's not my field of expertise. 
But it's, this is a historical question and not a literary question, right? And hence, literary scholars ideally ought to help historians and work together with historians by showing what sort of work came from authors with what sort of training and background. If there were men who wrote plays or poetry other than Shakespeare, who only had a grammar school education, what do we see in their writings? If there were others like Marlowe, who had a Cambridge education, what do we see in their writings? How does it compare? And how can you reconstruct what is plausible to infer about Shakespeare's education and hence whether it is plausible that Shakespeare is or is not the author? So finally, while it is valid to say that we should be especially careful or cautious about making biographical inferences from the plays because of the sort of genre that they are, that doesn't mean that therefore we have to throw out the plays as evidence entirely. And I think that this is, for one thing, it is a, an improper carryover of rules and standards from literary theory into history, right? from literary questions to historical questions. And what is more, it's a rule that nobody really follows completely, but that is only applied selectively to particular sorts of arguments. Okay, so what does that leave? What are the remaining unresolved questions for both sides? Well, I would say the big unanswered conundrum for Stratfordians are... For one thing, why the total lack of personal papers and records? Why are there no manuscripts from Shakespeare when there are from most other writers of the time, including much less prolific ones, right? This is a hole that Stratfordians have not filled. Is it possible that maybe Shakespeare destroyed his personal records or papers? I've never seen that argument made. It would seem to fit with the the very suggestive passage in The Tempest about Prospero destroying his books. This is an unresolved problem. And as for anti-Stratfordians, there are other problems, particularly when it comes to the publication of the narrative poems, The Venus and Adonis and The Rape of Lucrece, which were printed before most of Shakespeare's plays which are attributed to Shakespeare, have dedications written by Shakespeare, which are in very good polished form, and which most scholars agree Shakespeare was involved in publishing. So if this is true, if Shakespeare or the author was directly involved in publishing those poems, then are they really by Shakespeare? If they are, then what about the many thematic and stylistic overlaps and resonances between those poems and the plays, as well as the sonnets? If Shakespeare did write Venus and Adonis in The Rape of Lucrece, then don't you have to accept that he wrote the plays as well? And if Shakespeare didn't write them, then we have to ask, okay, then why did the real author have those published under the name Shakespeare? Why not just have them printed anonymously? Right? as so often happened with many literary works. Why is it that already this early on, we see works being falsely attributed to Shakespeare, if that's what's going on? And again, although there may have been a stigma against print, there was not a stigma attaching to poetry of the same sort that attached to the theater. Right? Writing a narrative poem wasn't necessarily as dangerous or disreputable or controversial as writing a play, right? Now, I think that this is where the induction scene in The Taming of the Shrew maybe comes in, because The Taming of the Shrew was surely written before Venus and Adonis was published. And if we take that induction scene as a suggestion that some arrangement had been made for Shakespeare to stand in or pose as an author, of works that were really being written by an aristocrat, which is what most anti-Stratfordians, or at least more credible ones, tend to think, then that arrangement must have already been made by the time that scene was written. And The Taming of the Shrew was written by 1592. In other words, the arrangement had been made, the fix was in, so to speak, before then Venus and Adonis was printed in 1593. So... Anyway, if you had to come up with a scenario, that's the one that I would 
tend to lean towards, that very early on, by the very beginning of what we consider to be Shakespeare's career, he had already made some sort of agreement to take the credit for someone else's work. Okay, now what about the nagging question of if Shakespeare didn't write this stuff, then who did? So, on the one hand, I don't think that's a particularly important question, or at least it's not as important as first questioning, is it conceivable that it wasn't William Shakespeare? That's really what has to be decided first. Now, if someone manages to somehow find a trove of letters or manuscripts of, you know, I am the Earl of Essex and I have secretly been writing Hamlet and Macbeth, you know, short of such a jackpot discovery, we're going to have to simply work without knowing. But there are certain aspects of Shakespeare's life and biography that stand out that do possibly seem to connect to the content and themes of his plays, right? So it's not quite right to say that there's no evident connection or no resonance between what we know about Shakespeare, his experiences, his beliefs, his commitments, and the plays. And if someone else wrote the plays, then we have to consider that whoever that person is, they should also fit these criteria, right? It must have been someone who was familiar with Elizabethan literature, who had some kind of connection to the literary or theatrical world, who lived in the right period of time. And furthermore, if we look at William Shakespeare himself, one of the big subjects that has been increasingly debated and examined is his religion. We have no record at all of Shakespeare ever attending any church or expressing any kind of religious commitment of one sort or another. Late in his life, he did buy a share in the tithes of the Holy Trinity Church in Stratford. And so by virtue of that, he became a lay rector. But we don't know if that means that he really believed in or even attended that church. And on the other side, as people have increasingly reconstructed, there is a good deal of evidence that Shakespeare's father and that many of his relatives on both sides of his family were Catholic recusants, right? that they maintained some tie to the Catholic faith and that they did not attend Protestant worship. This also includes Shakespeare's daughter, Susanna Shakespeare Hall, who later in her life was cited for failing to take communion in church, and this was commonly understood to be a sign of being a Catholic recusant. There are also posthumous claims, so people who went and collected the anecdotes about Shakespeare after his death. According to local sources, he was reputed to be a Catholic, he had died a Catholic. Some of them also said that he had been a schoolmaster in Stratford. Now, he could not have actually been a full-fledged schoolmaster in his own right because he didn't have a university degree. And so hence, if this is true, and it seems possible it's true, then he must have worked with some other schoolmaster as a sort of assistant teacher. And if we look at who were the schoolmasters opening schools and teaching around Stratford in this era, most of them were Catholic recusants from Lancashire, right, a county north of Warwickshire that had a large Catholic population and a large Catholic recusant gentry class that was well-to-do, well-educated, but that couldn't get jobs in government or the clergy because they were Catholic. So if Shakespeare was a schoolmaster at some point before going to London, it's likely that he worked with and had connections to this Lancashire Catholic network. And furthermore, if we look at him in London, he engaged in many business transactions and had many associates who signed on with him as trustees for these financial and real estate transactions. And most all of them were fellow members of the theater world, other actors and theater managers. Except there is one exception. One of his documents was co-signed by a goldsmith named Thomas Savage, right? Someone who had nothing to do with the theater world. But this goldsmith, Thomas Savage, was a Catholic recusant from Lancashire, right? So there are all of these signs here that Shakespeare's social network included connections to this Catholic recusant world. And similarly in the sonnets, if you look at sonnet 52, 
the final couplet begins, blessed are you whose worthiness gives scope, right? And this is one of many apparent religious references and uses of religious language when talking about the young man. And that phrase, blessed are you, was most closely associated with the Catholic rosary prayer to the Virgin Mary, right? Blessed are you among women. The young man, as I said, is, is often referred to in religious terms compared to angels or to saints. There are references to pilgrimage, right? All of these practices like saint veneration that continued to be associated with the Catholic Church. And also in Sonnet 52, the, the overwhelming theme is secrecy, right? Secret meetings, secret objects like robes being kept hidden. And so there's strong suggestion that maybe Sonnet 52 is referring to some shared secret between Shakespeare and the young man. Maybe not just their sexual affair, but something religious, right? Maybe their shared connection to Catholicism, right? If we look at the plays, most of Shakespeare's plays are set in Catholic settings, right? There are many in Italy, as we said. There are some set in France, Illyria, other places on the continent. And the English plays mostly take place in medieval England, right? In the 15th century, when England was still a Catholic country. So overall, the, the vast bulk of the characters and settings of his plays are Catholic. And moreover, some Catholic clergy sometimes make appearances in the plays, and they tend to be portrayed pretty positively. For example, Friar Lawrence in Romeo and Juliet, and the young novice nun Isabella in Measure for Measure. Right? So all in all, there seems to be a sort of connection or carryover between Shakespeare's life that has these many connections to the Catholic recusant world and the plays. Well, this then raises the question, if Shakespeare isn't the author of these works, then why do they show this resonance with Catholicism? If we entertain anyone else as a possible candidate, it would make most sense if they were also a Catholic recusant or had some sympathies or ties to Catholicism. Okay, so let's keep that one in mind. Secondly, there's Shakespeare's name. Shakespeare's name makes appearances in his writings. Okay, of course, on the title pages, we see his name spelled many different ways, right? Often with a hyphen, right? And sometimes anti Stratfordians have used that to argue that everyone knew somehow this was a pseudonym. When the works were printed, his name is spelled Shake hyphen Spear as opposed to just one word, which is how it's written in manuscripts. And James Shapiro argues that this doesn't really mean anything because it was very difficult to print the letters K and S right next to each other. So he argues that uh, printers put the letter E or a hyphen or both to separate out the K and the S, and that's why it looks different in print as opposed to in handwriting. I don't know. Some, some other expert on Elizabethan print would have to comment on that. But the mere fact that there are differences in variation and format of the name does not show that it's a pseudonym. But instead, if we look into the contents of his writings, especially the sonnets, there are many puns and references to the name Will and also to the initials WS. Now, a really glaring example of this is in sonnet number 136, right, which is one of the poems heavily punning on the name Will, and it ends with the couplet, Make but my name thy love, and love that still, and then thou lovest me, for my name is Will. So, okay, if you do take the sonnets as personal documents, which I do, and which most anti-Stratfordians do, you have to reckon seriously with the fact that he says, my name is Will. So here are two things to keep in mind, right? Neither of them is definite, but in both cases it seems that if we find another candidate, probably they should have some connection to Catholic recusancy, and probably they should be named Will or William. Not definite, but seems likely, right? So let's talk about who some of these candidates are, and I'm not going to dwell on this very much, again, because I think it's a wide open question. It could be someone we've never heard of. It could be someone we'll never identify. But some comments we can make, for one thing, Bacon is right out. 
right? The styles do not fit. The logistics don't make any sense. He was extremely busy, right? Just as much as William Shakespeare or more so. So the notion that Bacon is the author just raises more questions than it answers. Same is true with it was Queen Elizabeth, it was Christopher Marlowe, all of these kinds of far-fetched, ridiculous theories. Oxford is the currently most popular alternate candidate. I have not read much about Oxford. I don't particularly care that much. I find the case to be rather weak, okay? There are some of the same problems, right? Why, okay, why does it say my name is Will if Oxford's name was Edward? Uh, there's also the big glaring problem of Edward de Vere, the Earl of Oxford's death in 1604, right? There are many later plays, such as The Tempest, The Winter's Tale, The Two Noble Kinsmen, and others, that are widely agreed to have been written after that time. Not only are there references that seem to resonate with events, but also there is a clear stylistic development. You can see an evolution of a more abstruse, more romantic, mysterious sort of style, both of content and language, in these later plays. And as James Shapiro argues very strongly, I think, these plays were clearly fitted to Blackfriars Theatre, a smaller, more intimate theatre, where actors had to take breaks, they were working by candlelight, and that had a more upper-class audience that at that time in the Jacobian age had an increasing taste for romance and mystery, right? So Oxford dying in 1604, as far as I can see, makes him a very, very unlikely alternate candidate. Some have argued now recently for Emilia Bassano, Right? There are many strong women in Shakespeare's plays. Many plays uh, involve women's points of view and their complex ideas and personalities. Uh, she was from a musical background. Her parents were instrument makers. She was Venetian, okay? And there's this clear repeating connection in Shakespeare's plays to Venice and the Veneto, Verona. So there are many reasons why people have connected Emilia Bassano, who was a writer and was the mistress of the Lord Chamberlain who patronized Shakespeare's acting company, why she has been connected to Shakespeare's plays and some have even argued for her as the author. But she was a published poet. She had a book of poetry printed. The style doesn't match, right? If we're using stylometrics as a criterion, which many scholars do now and it's had a lot of good results, Emilia Bassano is also out. Now, at one point in his book, James Shapiro sort of briefly brushes past another figure, which he doesn't much care about because he doesn't believe in any alternate authorship theory. But he mentions the Earl of Derby, who happened to be the son-in-law of the Earl of Oxford, right, of another candidate. And he, his name was William Stanley, Right? So his first name is William. His last initial is S. He lived 1561 to 1642. His family was understood to be a family of Catholic recusants. And furthermore, he was first put forward as a possible candidate in 1891 when an archivist was able to find a pair of letters in the state archives of, in Britain. And these were two letters written by a... Catholic spy named George Fenner, a Jesuit spy working in England in the 1590s. And he sent these letters back to his associates in continental Europe, but they were intercepted and confiscated by the English government. And in these two letters, this Jesuit, George Fenner, reported that Darby was unlikely to help advance the Roman Catholic cause in England because he was, quote, busy penning plays for the common players. So if we credit these secret documents, it seems that Darby was writing plays, and furthermore for the common players implies that he was writing them to be publicly performed by an acting troupe. No one knows what these plays are, where they ended up, and in these other respects, he seems to basically fit the profile that we should want, an upper-class titled gentleman who wouldn't have wanted the public at large to know, probably, that he was writing plays, understood to be a Catholic recusant, and has the right first name and initials. 
So Shapiro mentions this in his book and then sort of brushes past it and really kind of incredulously says, it's not clear why anti-Stratfordians dropped Darby as a candidate and moved on instead to the Earl of Oxford. Maybe the Earl of Oxford had a more exciting romantic life. We have images of Edward de Vere, the Earl of Oxford. He gave people something more concrete, something more interesting to latch on to than did William Stanley, the Earl of Derby. But for my part, if someone were to ask me, well, if it's not William Shakespeare, who was it? I would say, I don't know. There's any number of possibilities. I'm not an expert on Elizabethan prosopography, and I can't tell you. But if I had to pick someone, it would be William Stanley, the Earl of Derby. Okay, now, as I said before, maybe the answer isn't clear-cut black and white. Either it was Shakespeare or it was someone else. If you look at current Shakespeare scholarship, there's a bit of a revolution happening right now. As people more and more come to terms with a scary, complicated, mysterious phenomenon of Elizabethan theater that hasn't really been grappled with before, and that phenomenon is collaboration. There is a revolution going on in current scholarship where what was once seen as a kind of crackpot idea or unlikely, especially in reference to Shakespeare, is now universally accepted. And the dimensions of the phenomenon and its ramifications are still unknown. So it seems that in the late 15 and early 1600s, many plays that were performed, possibly even most plays that were staged, were actually collaborative products written by more than one author in some kind of exchange or, or cooperation. This was first demonstrated, or at least the first indications of this, were only found in 1780 when the diary of a theatrical producer and impresario named Philip Henslow were discovered. And Henslow's diary, it mostly describes 1580s, and so it really predates Shakespeare's appearance on this scene. It does not mention Shakespeare. But it does show instances of Henslow often paying as many as four different writers to work on a play in stages. And yet, so far as we know, once these plays were completed and performed, they would be presented and then published as the work of one man. So it seems there's a pattern here of works that were actually collaborative being attributed to only one author. Now, for many years, Shakespeare scholars rejected the idea that Shakespeare collaborated. They say he has such a distinct style, he's so much better than all his contemporaries, he clearly wrote his own work. But, in fact, there are now many examples of plays that have been traditionally attributed to Shakespeare that are surely products of collaboration. For instance, Titus Andronicus was most likely co-written with George Peel. Sir Thomas More was, as I said, an unproduced play discovered years later that was co-written by five different authors, none of them identified for certain, but one was most likely Shakespeare. Pericles was co-written by Shakespeare and George Wilkins. The lost play Cardenio was co-authored by Shakespeare and Fletcher. Henry VIII was also co-written by Shakespeare and Fletcher. And one of his last plays, The Two Noble Kinsmen, was co-written with Fletcher. And those are just the most certain examples. There are other likely possibilities, such as Timon of Athens was very likely co-written by Shakespeare and Thomas Middleton. And as for the three Henry VI plays, which are early on in the Shakespeare canon... Well, a few years ago, Oxford University Press formally credited those three plays to Shakespeare and Marlowe. So it seems that they were co-written, sort of passing back and forth with the two of them writing different scenes and passages. And that conclusion by Oxford University Press that Marlowe is a co-author of the Henry VI plays was based mostly on stylometric analysis, right? statistical analysis of the occurrence of words, phrases, syntactical forms, rhythms, right? which was used not only to identify Marlowe, but to pick out the particular passages that Marlowe reportedly wrote. 
So this, I think, raises a very similar and maybe a larger dilemma than the Apocrypha, right? If we know, as I said earlier, if we know that some plays were falsely attributed to Shakespeare, then why not all of them? And likewise, if we know that some plays, many plays, were falsely attributed to Shakespeare alone, when in fact they were co-written by more than one author, then we have to ask, how do we know this isn't true of all of the plays? Say it's possible to check if we take a play like Henry VI Part I, and we check using a computer program, was this co-written by Shakespeare and Marlowe? And the program is able to say yes, because they have other works by Marlowe against which to compare, well then what about a work like Hamlet? Can you, do, can you ask the same question if you don't know who the potential other co-authors might be, who the collaborators might be? How would you check? Is there a computer program that has the power to simply say, this speech is by Shakespeare, this speech is by someone else, if they don't know who the someone else is that they're looking for. So I don't know. I don't know if that's possible. What if, for instance, as I might just hypothesize casually, what if the Earl of Derby was a collaborator with Shakespeare? What if they knew each other, had some connection through this Catholic recusant network, and they worked on plays together? How would we know that if we don't have other another body of writings by Darby against which to compare? Maybe what we think of as Shakespeare in quotation marks is actually an agglomeration of work by William Shakespeare and other people, one or more other authors who were not named, in the same way that Peel wasn't named on the title page of Titus Andronicus, and George Wilkins wasn't named as an author of Pericles, and so on. It seems to me that there's an enormous range of possibilities and questions here that I don't know that we have the information or the power to answer at this point. And I would say, is this compatible, possibly, with Diana Price's argument that Shakespeare acted as a play broker and a front man, accepting credit for plays he didn't write? Is it possible that maybe the truth is somewhere in between, that Shakespeare was taking credit for work he co-produced? And we do have testimonies, such as from Ben Jonson, that Shakespeare was eloquent, that he was talented with a turn of phrase, that he could improvise and speechify. If that's true, then maybe a lot of this material that doesn't seem like it could be from Shakespeare, all this, all this information and metaphors referring to falconry and hunting and, and drawing on names and incidents from Spanish and French literature— Maybe this was part of some body of material that Shakespeare then shaped or revised in order to achieve a level of beauty and eloquence, right? Which it seems all our sources consistently sh say Shakespeare did have, right? So Shapiro in his book says that the fact of collaboration is devastating to the Oxfordians because they couldn't possibly imagine this aloof aristocrat deigning to work together and associate with low-born writers like George Wilkins. Well, I don't know. Maybe that's true. I've never seen any Oxfordians' comments about the issue of collaboration, and I don't much care because <laughs> I don't think their arguments are that strong anyway. Right? But this is a case, again, of a straw man and also of Stratfordian scholars adopting Oxfordian's definition of the question and accepting the notion that it has to be either Shakespeare, all Shakespeare, or all Oxford, and that the truth can't be somewhere in between, right, or somewhere else, right, which is where personally I suspect that it is. And finally, I would also point out that the fact of collaboration, which is now pretty well established, it vitiates the argument about conspiracies and a conspiracy theory. Right? If, if Marlowe was a co-author of the Henry VI plays and someone else was a co-author of Titus Andronicus, is it a conspiracy that nobody ever mentioned this in the contemporary documents? Is it a conspiracy theory because there was no one at the time who spoke about and commented on this collaborative authorship and that instead the 
First Folio presented these plays as solely the work of William Shakespeare? I don't think so. I don't think this is a conspiracy. This is just a fact that the authorship was more complicated and was not actually the way it was represented in these earliest publications. And so hence, we now have to grapple with the possibility that the original attribution is not true or is not entirely true. Okay, so lastly, why is it, again, that this debate is so messed up? Why is it that these, I think, very valid and complicated questions have sort of been shunted aside into really the back alleys of the internet to be bandied about by crackpots? Well, I think it's because this question evokes a visceral and emotional reaction on many people's parts, right? I can remember being at a sort of casual party with actors and writers who had been involved in putting on productions of Shakespeare. And one of them mentioned this notion that some people think it was someone else who wrote these plays. And my friend, who was a director and playwright, reacted immediately and said, Shakespeare was the son of a glover. These plays were written by the son of a glover. It was a sort of emotional rejection of the very idea. And I think, again, that's because the story that we do get of Shakespeare For some people, it's very unsatisfying because we have so little detail about his life. But for some people, it's very gratifying and very appealing. And it is possibly the greatest example of the myth of the lone, self-made man. And this myth really justifies a different kind of elitism, right? You might say that Oxfordians and others like them are snobs, and that's fine. But there's another sort of elitism, which is the elitism of meritocracy, right? The notion that successful people deserve to be where they are because if you rise, it's due to your own inherent worth, your, your own brilliance, your own drive and ambition. And the counterpoint to that then is if you do not rise, then you just weren't good enough, right? It's not because of disadvantages or inequalities in how people are educated, for instance, It underpins a kind of social Darwinism, right? The idea it isn't your background or your social connections that determine your success. It is your inherent brilliance, right? And this reference again and again to, but he was a genius. I think scholars who really should know better often keep referring to that and falling back on that because it feels right for their sensibilities to say, well, some people are just geniuses. And that's why they've they've risen to this position. And this, I think, particularly is flattering to the self-image that academics like to have about themselves, right? That they have this position of prominence and prestige, not because of the social background or environment that they came from that sort of put them on the right track for that place in life, but rather because it's it's because of their brilliance, it's because of their hard work, their study, right? And this is how universities increasingly justify themselves to the world, that they are the centers, the meccas of this kind of self-made meritocratic elite. They're not the old-fashioned aristocratic elite, they are the new, smart, brainy, meritocratic elite, right? And Hence, when they see Oxfordians or other anti-Stratfordians, kind of, they see them as barbarians at the gate, right? As people who have not gone through the proper process of credentialing, right? Who are trying to skip the whole uh, vetting process. They see these outsiders, they, they often lump them together, whether rightly or wrongly, they lump them together with the really growing wave of kind of conspiracy theorists who attack the credentialed elite, the sort of upswell of anti-intellectualism that wants to just kind of spin theories without proper vetting and verification, right? And so for both valid and invalid reasons, this debate has become symbolic, right? And, And this is why I think people often sort of instinctively associate it with other weird crackpot conspiracy theories like moon landing being faked, right? It's not really about the substance of the arguments and the weight of evidence. 
It's about the symbolism of who is on what side, right? And I should probably say that just the fact that I'm recording this and that I'm entertaining the anti-Stratfordian arguments at all will probably get me canceled immediately in many academic circles. I don't know. It would be nice if people listened and engaged with these arguments like I'm trying to do, but I understand that many people aren't going to respond that way. They're just going to immediately say, you're a loony, for even engaging in this discussion. But Regardless of all that, I hope that you enjoyed it. I know this has been a very long discussion, but I hope, again, it's been worthwhile. And thank you so much for listening.